Supremacy Games Chapter 1176-1200 Years ago, the visiting Elemental's representatives made their first contact with the Alliance. When the Alliance realized that they came from a unique galaxy that was filled with beings like them, their first thought was obviously forcefully conquering it. Unfortunately, all of their people went missing and a connection to the UVR wasn't established, so their excitement washed away from the fear of the unknown. This pushed the Alliance to engage with the visiting Elemental's representatives in a civil manner. Through their discussions, they found out that their galaxy would remain inaccessible to outsiders and even reject the establishment of the network there. Even though those terms were too hard to swallow for the Ten Rulers, they still agreed to have them join their Alliance. All because the Elementals had offered them multiple trading offers with an insane amount of Elemental Stones in return for the simplest and cheapest thing in the universe, food. Sadly, not in our reality in this year with its crazy inflation. This meant the Alliance would never dare split ways with the Elementals as they were trading one of the most important resources in the universe with something they had an abundance supply. As for why Elementals desire the Alliance's food so much? Well, it was simple really. Elementals could neither reproduce nor die, they do not have any desire for treasures or riches, and most of them could not embark on fun journeys or such. Since they could live for eternity by merely consuming a bit of elemental energy on daily basis, this left them almost absolutely void of desires. It was obvious what boredom could do to someone who was immortal and without much desire. To avoid having the elementals fall into the same crippling depression as the primogenitors, the elemental gods and goddesses decided to seek ways of introducing new entertainment to the lives of their followers. After all, it would be the greatest irony to have elementals commit suicide after finally reaching their final forms by awakening their consciousness. With some effort, they found out about the Alliance outside of their galaxy and the UVR, the greatest source of entertainment ever invented. The original plan was to join the Alliance and introduce the UVR in the Elmin Edel's galaxy, but it was shut down by foremother Siasim, the reason wasn't stated by her. This forced the elemental gods and goddesses to switch to simply trading food with their infinite elemental stones. By using their advanced consciousness prowess, the elementals were capable of mimicking the tasting sense, allowing them to eat as much of that delicious food as possible. It might not seem like much, but the alliance's food was literally the glue that was keeping the elementals sane in their galaxy. After Felix and his companions spent an hour or so discussing the remaining rules, Miss Monica finally concluded the meeting and embarked on the journey with them. After they entered Elder Hemir's wormhole and exited on the other side, the first thing that Felix did was check on the network's connection. Not a single bar. Felix uttered, We are officially out of Queen AI's radar. I can't believe we won't be connecting to the UVR for centuries or more. Olivia murmured, this feels kinda weird. Are you already having a withdrawal? Selfie giggled. In this era, the UVR was like the worst addictive substance which was depended on by almost everyone. Just like the old internet, it might seem like it had no bad effects when used, but when it was taken from someone, they end up with the worst possible withdrawal case. Just one week without the internet would cause a daily user to feel like his life was thrown in chaos don't even mention, years, decades, or more. Toughen up and forget about anything related to the outside world. Felix advised them with a solemn tone, if you really want to grow stronger in this journey, you can't have your focus on the outside world. This was exactly what Felix planned on doing, complete zoning in this galaxy to grow stronger as fast as possible. Who knows? He might also integrate with his last bloodline here and find a way to break through the origin realm. Well, I suggest that you begin your training right now. Miss Monica informed while yawning, Stravi is one month away. For real? I thought it will take at least a couple of years even if we took all the nearby wormholes. Badadai asked with a curious tone, is the wormhole network here as advanced as the Alliance? It's not. Miss Monica stated, it's even more advanced. You're joking, right? 
Badadai refused to believe this since his race owned the wormhole transportation system and they worked extremely hard to keep it afloat since each wormhole required continuous fuel of energy. Your wormhole network is operated by space worms while our wormhole network is operated by the spatial god, Yehendern. Miss Monica shared, all the wormholes across the entire galaxy are his followers and listen to his commands. Unlike you guys, our wormholes are flexible in their pathing instead of them being fixed. What does that mean? Olivia asked. Simple, their wormhole network can be considered as a breathing hive. They can communicate with them and make sure to reserve wormholes in advance to shorten their distance as much as possible. Felix eyed Miss Monica, am I right? Yes. Miss Monica approved casually, not caring about exposing such a secret since she knew that they would figure it out sooner or later during their stay. Flexible wormholes, we just stepped inside the Elemental's galaxy and my mind is already blown. Olivia murmured with an odd tone. She could not envision how could natural wormholes switch the points they were connected to at will. But, this was the elemental galaxy, where nothing really was going to make sense and if she wanted to keep her sanity intact, she better strap in and believe herself to be in Wonderland. One month later, the eternal Nautilus could be seen flying at a moderate speed in direction of a humongous planet that was at least three times the size of Jupiter. It had more than 300 moons of varied colors and sizes orbiting it at different ranges, resembling a miniature solar system. Whoa, ah, it's so beautiful. Olivia remarked with a look of wonder in her eyes as she stared at the magnificent planet from a window. Although the planet was enormous and most likely could contain thousands of Earth, it still resembled it greatly as it had continents, oceans, mountainous chains, volcanoes, forests, and even icy north and south poles. Before the others could feast on the planet's beauty, all of them were greeted with a sonorous gentle voice in their minds. Welcome my dear guests. I hope you have a pleasant stay on my humble bod. Thank you, Elder. Felix bowed his head respectfully in direction of the planet, knowing that it was Stravi speaking to them. The others figured out the same and showed their appreciation as well, feeling more comfortable now. Most of them felt like they were being blown by the wind as everything was new and weird. The fact that they had no Queen AI or Alliance to back them up made it even worse for them to feel at ease. Fortunately, this feeling was gone with Elder Stravia's welcoming words, knowing that if they were under his care, no one would bully them on this planet. Lord Fenrir, Lady Sphinx, I am honored to have been blessed with your company. If you require anything, Please do not hesitate to voice your request. Elder Stravi addressed the primogenitors alone this time. Much appreciated. Lady Sphinx smiled politely. The same goes back to you. Fenrir stated calmly, as long as we occupy your land, you can ask us anything and we will do our best to ease your inquires. Thank you. Elder Stravi sounded a bit delighted by Fenrir's offer. Who could blame him? Although he was a giant planet awakening his consciousness, he could not move from his place unless he received permission from Foremother Siasim. This meant that he didn't have much understanding of the universe outside of his little bubble and it would please him a lot to gain some new knowledge. I have already spoken to the Northern Forest Chieftain and he has accepted to have you stay in his land with his people. Elder Stravi informed, Little Monica will lead you there. Felix and the others thanked him again and continued their journey toward the biggest continent on this planet, which resembled an upside-down Africa. Because of the planet's humongous size, just this continent alone had a hundred times the land surface of Earth if not more. After a couple of hours, the eternal Nautilus stopped on the exosphere above a vast multicolored forest. Felix and his companions exited the spaceship and continued the rest of their journey on a much smaller spaceship that wouldn't disturb the environment as much as that behemoth. Some time later, the spaceship landed on an empty grass field that was surrounded by humongous towering trees that seemed to have faces on their trunks. Whoosh! The spaceship's door opened and created a moving ladder. The moment Felix and his companions stepped outside of the spaceship, they were smacked in the face by the freshest and cleanest air they had ever felt in their lives. It smelled so good and just a single breath of it made them feel like their nostrils and lungs were cleansed by holy water. 
Dear Lord, this isn't just fresh air alone, it's elemental energy thick enough to manifest as air. Felix exclaimed with a look filled with awe as he kept breathing in and out like a crack addict. This was Felix's reaction when he had absolutely no familiarity with nature. As for Selfie and Olivia, just one glance at them and one would believe they were drugged out. Especially Olivia, who had the runic seed of life in her body plus insane nature runic familiarity, making her skin seem like she was glowing with a green aura. I feel like I am being warmly embraced. Olivia uttered with her eyes closed shut, giving off a euphoric sensation. This is really an interesting sensation. Selfie agreed with her as she floated around the spaceship, allowing the wind to carry her around. Time element might be her specialty but she was a five-elementalist in reality with mastery over fire, wind, earth, nature, and time. So, she was feeling like everything around her was breathing the same breath as her. This is nothing. Miss Monica shared, wait until you experience elemental energy being channeled through you. Just as Felix was about to dive into this subject, Miss Monica took off into the woods, follow me closely if you don't want to get lost, the forest tribe loves messing with their guests. Felix and the others didn't know what she meant by that and they weren't planning on finding out. Felix beamed the spaceship in his spatial card and chased after her with the rest. Kikiki, Kikiki. As they were walking through the towering woods and colorful falling leaves, all of them kept hearing eerie children giggles each time a breeze passed by them. Olivia got close to Felix instinctively at this creepy situation while Selfie wanted to do the same but her moral compass stopped her since she wasn't really scared. What are those? Felix inquired as he looked around him, scanning the moving leaves, branches, and stiffened trees. It's those little brats trying to prank you. Miss Monica floated to a pinkish glowing giant mushroom that was growing on a tree trunk and lightly smacked it in the head with an annoyed look. Oh, oh. The giggles turned into a pained wailing immediately, the glowing mushroom shrunk in size and hid inside the trunk before an image of a humanoid little mushroom child manifested in the air akin to a ghost. Before Felix and the others could react, hundreds of those little children manifested around them from countless hidden mushrooms. Bad auntie. We will complain to you to father. All the mushroom children spoke simultaneously with grumpy looks. Little brats, who are you calling auntie? Miss Monica gave them a death stare as she manifested hundreds of water spheres around her. You better correct yourselves or this auntie is going to give you a well-needed shower. Sis sister, we were just playing. Yes, yes, yes. All of the mushroom spirits disappeared instantly with horrified looks, retracting their beautiful mushroom tops into the soil. Much better, follow me Miss Monica restarted her journey with a gentle smile as if nothing happened. Interesting, even as living fungi, they are still fearing being overwatered. Lady Sphinx commented. She knew that when mushrooms were overwatered, the fungi get exposed to rot, stunting their growth and development. They also get prevented from reproducing which could cause them to die. Of course, we might have gained our consciousness, but our weaknesses are still there. Miss Monica explained, we just get better at defending ourselves, nothing more or less. So, if a fire were to spread in this forest, what's going to happen? Badadai asked with a curious tone. Chief Cloveris will be forced to use fire to fight off fire in addition to requesting the Lake Sisters' help to put it off. Miss Monica answered. Isn't that a bit too complicated? Felix frowned, can't he just request the help of Elder Stravi? He can, but Elder Stravi will never help. Miss Monica explained, as long as things haven't reached an apocalyptic level in his celestial body, he rarely interferes with anything ongoing. So. Everyone is left to fend for themselves. I see. Only now did Felix begin to sense that something wasn't right with how things were being operated around here. He always assumed that the planet's consciousness was keeping order and that anyone breaking it would be punished. But in reality, he didn't seem to care at all and this made Felix understand that life on this planet wasn't going to be as peaceful as he envisioned. I hope I am overthinking things. Felix wished as he disappeared through the woods behind Miss Monica. 
Some time later, Miss Monica and the rest emerged from between a field of tall sunflowers. The moment they appeared on the other side, Felix and his companions had their eyes widened in amazement. How mystical! What in th? This is an actual village. It looks like it came out of a fairy tale. All of them showed the same reaction of wonderment at the picturesque and enchanting village before them. The village was surrounded by tall trees that provided shade and shelter, and the lush colorful leaves rustled gently in the wind. In the center of the village stood a large, old-fashioned well, surrounded by cobblestone streets and quaint, colorful cottages. Each cottage had a thatched roof and a garden filled with fragrant flowers. Yet, the most mystical part about it was the villagers as they were walking humanoid and beautified plants, fungi, trees, and almost all of the plants' families. For the plants' families without the ability to terraform their shape, they release consciousness manifestations resembling floating ghosts like the previous mushrooms. Everyone seemed friendly and happy to be doing their chores, like tending to their gardens or the livestock of many unique and new farm animals. Felix and the others might not be sure, but all of them felt that despite its serene beauty, there was an underlying sense of danger in the villagers' eyes like they would never hesitate to protect their home and each other from danger. They are looking at us, what do we do? Olivia spoke under her breath nervously after realizing that all of the villagers' eyes were on them. Don't be nervous. Felix smiled kindly as he stared back at the villagers after seeing that their eyes didn't carry malice but mere curiosity. He knew that in their eyes, they seem more like interesting aliens. You want candy? Selfa beamed a package of sweets and offered it with a gentle smile to a bunch of little flower kids in their ghost form. Unexpectedly, the moment the villagers' eyes landed on that sweets box, all of them had their eyes brightened up like they had seen a treasure. Crap! Felix knew that look never ends well, making him snatch the sweets box from Selfa's hand and beam it in his spatial card. This made the villagers' eyes turn dim again especially the kids, making Selfa feel bad. Felix. We will give out our gifts to the chief and chieftain. Felix interrupted her, it's best if they handled this since we have no idea of the situation here. All Felix and his companions knew was that the elementals desired food, making them prepare tons of food from all types to win their favor. But this didn't mean that they should be throwing food on any elemental they saw. Felix understood that in this sort of situation, it was best for the leaders to handle it so they wouldn't be causing mass chaos. You're a smart little fella. Suddenly, a humanoid ghost of a white wooden tree manifested before Felix and his companions. Although he seemed to have praised Felix, he had a strict and distant expression. However, he was followed by a giant ghost of a humanoid sunflower who had long golden hair, pinkish lips, fair skin, and was wearing a dress out of her own green leaves. She had the sweetest and kindest smile that was enough to melt anyone's heart and calm crying children with a mere look. When those two beings were standing next to each other, they truly resembled a stern father and a loving kind mother. The villagers seemed to think so too as they treated them with similar respect. Chief Cloverus, Chief Tess Sunflower, I have brought the guests. Miss Monica informed politely. Thank you, Monica. Chief Tess Sunflower showed an appreciative kind smile before turning to Felix and his companions. Then, she requested, please follow us to the village hall. Without saying much, they went after them, walking through the mystical village. It might seem serene and enchanting, but it was nowhere small, in fact, it could be considered a city based on size alone. After a few minutes of speed walking, Felix and the rest arrived at the biggest cottage in the village. What was surprising about it was the fact it was built inside a humongous thick white tree that was hollow from the middle. They took a set of stairs to reach the cottage while looking below them at the gathering villagers underneath the white tree. This must be the chief's body. Olivia murmured softly near Felix's ear not able to use the telepathic messaging anymore without Queen AI's involvement. Just as Felix was about to agree with her, Chief Cloverus replied composedly, It is not my body. Ah, uh, I am sorry. Olivia apologized hastily. No need to apologize, it's my fault for not introducing myself properly. 
Chief Cloverus hovered in front of the hall's door and turned to them. He stared at them for a moment and then introduced himself with the same stern look, I have been named Cloverus by Elder Stravi. I am the consciousness of the entire northern forest and the chief of Emerald Glen Village. While Olivia and the others gasped, Ladies Finks and Fenrir didn't show much of a reaction as they had already anticipated his response after sensing his consciousness prowess. Felix and the others might not be able to see it, but Chieftain Cloverus was emitting an insane intense aura that was big enough it covered the entire forest taken to a barrier. This made her understand that he had reach and control over everything inside this forest, even them. He might be just a mere forest's consciousness, but they understood that he was an extremely dangerous individual, who could easily match Primogenitor's consciousness strength in his territory. This galaxy is truly filled with hidden dragons and crouching tigers. Lady Sphinx smiled faintly, how interesting. This is my wife, Chief Tess Sunflower. She is the sunflower field surrounding the entire village and protecting it from invaders. If she didn't want you to find the village, you wouldn't have been able to find it even if you took flight. Chief Cloverus introduced his wife with a tint of pride and love in his tone. This chapter was first shared on the N0V3LB1N platform. Nice to meet you, everyone. Chief Tess Sunflower bowed politely in front of everyone before adding, If you need anything, just ask me. Thanks for the hospitality. Felix and his companions bowed their heads back in appreciation, knowing that they would be unwelcomed in most areas due to being outsiders. Take a seat. Chieftain Cloverus requested as he pointed at the living room inside the village hall. Just like all the cottage houses in this village, the chairs and tables were built with new and refined wood, making it seem like a craftsman had a hand in them. But in reality, it was just the villagers' own doings as all of them had wood-slash-plant manipulation depending on their species. After everyone sat down, Chieftain Cloverus inquired with a firm tone, First, I have to ask about your goal of coming all the way here. It consists of two goals, meeting Lord Zervan hopefully and taking advantage of the environment and time difference to get stronger. Felix answered truthfully, having no reason to be deceitful to the only people capable of helping him out. Meeting Lord Zervan? I don't think that's possible for even the elemental gods and goddesses. Chief Tess Sunflower glanced at Lady Sphinx and Fenrir, believing that they were the ones seeing this meeting. Is it really that difficult? Felix knitted his eyebrows. All I can tell you is that unless Lord Zervan wants to meet you, you will never manage to find him even if you searched the entire galaxy. Chieftain Clover is stressed. I see. Both Felix and Noah showed obvious looks of immense disappointment. As for Olivia and the rest? They merely had confused looks since Felix had never told them about his revival plan. In his eyes, there was no need to open Olivia's wounds by giving her false hope after she finally embarked on her healing journey. Only he and Noah were still hung up on the matter and clearly, they would not stop trying until no other options were left unchecked. I don't know what you want exactly from Lord Zervan, but I believe that he will give you some of his time. Chief Tess Sunflower smiled gently, he never allowed anyone to enter our galaxy regardless of what they offered, so, my advice is to just relax and wait for him to make contact. Thank you for your comforting words. Felix and Noah seemed to have some light restored in their eyes. It might seem like Chief Tess Sunflower merely said so to comfort them, but Felix truly believed her words. That's because he always felt deep down that Lord Zervan wouldn't have allowed them entry into his galaxy just because of Lord Osiris' favor alone. What made him more convinced was the fact he gave him permission to bring companions when Felix didn't even ask for it. It was only common sense to think that Lord Zervan must have plans for them, at least, that's what he hoped. As for your training, can you expand on this? Chieftain Sunflower asked with a confused tone. Well, we chose this planet because it seemed to be one of the few ones with almost every type of environment in it. Felix clarified, to train our elemental manipulations and runic spell casting we require rich environments with the same elemental energies as our familiarities slash affinities. In my case, 
I desire to train in environments with rich poison, lightning, gemstone, sand, and water elemental energies. Hmm? I thought outsiders can have only one elemental manipulation. Chieftain Cloverus was taken aback by Felix's varied list of elements. You're right, my situation is just a bit special. Felix replied without going through the details. I see. Chieftain Cloverus glanced at the rest, how about you? I'm only here for the time difference. Bodadai answered bluntly. I require an environment with rich nature elemental energy. Olivia shared with a shy tone. I hope for a rich nature, fire, earth and wind elemental energy to learn new spells. Self bowed politely. How about you? Chieftain Cloverus asked the silent Noah. Ice. Please. Noah replied expressionlessly, trying his best not to sound like a d-asterisk head. Fortunately for him, Chieftain Cloverus' strict and solemn persona made him favor those straightforward answers. Well, in the case of nature and earth elemental energy, there aren't many richer environments on this planet than my forest. Chieftain Cloverus shared as he eyed the girls, so if you want to train those elements here, you are free to go for it. I will make sure no one will bother you. Thank you, Elder. Much appreciated, Elder. Selfie and Olivia showed their gratitude immediately. As for you boys, all I can do is recommend you to North Pole Chief Arcturus and the Third Ocean Queen Merlinia, and see if they are in a good mood to help you out. Chieftain Cloverus informed. I am greatly thankful for the recommendation, but, what about the others, Elder? Is it possible for me to get in contact with them and seek a way to train in their territory? Felix stressed, I can even use food to buy an area or rent one. Well, food can get you in favor with many elementals around here, but you should understand that if you chose this path, you will get ripped off immensely. Chieftain Cloverus warned, not everyone is as easygoing as us. Some desert tribes, swamp tribes, and volcanic tribes are extremely hard to befriend. If they realize that you have a lot of food, they might not steal it from you due to Elder Stravi protection, but they will definitely clean you off in merely a decade or less. Upon hearing so, Felix couldn't help but knit his eyebrows deeply and start thinking of other options. In his mind, he believed that the food he brought would give him easy access to those territories to train his manipulations and spell casting, but, it seemed like not everyone was as nice and kind as the Northern Forest tribe. Felix understood that even though he brought a crazy amount of food, if he showed that he was an easy target to swindle, he would be cleared off in no time and he would have no more bargaining chips in his pockets. After all, he could neither return to the Alliance to bring more food nor make someone send him more without receiving permission. If you want to make it around here, you need to understand the world's structure and personalities of each environmental chief. Chief Tess Sunflower spoke softly, Elder Stravi is in the top five planets with the most intense conflicts occurring on monthly basis because of his nonchalant attitude towards conflicts. This gave birth to many tribes desiring to expand on their territory forcefully, not caring about encroaching on another tribe's territory. Unfortunately for you, most of your desired environments are in a state of war and aren't too interested in hosting guests. So, if you want to get their approval to train in their territory and even receive their assistance in the matter, you will be forced to choose their side in the war and even participate in it if you are deemed worthy. This is the only way to befriend them if you don't want to spend all of your food on buying their time. By the time Chieftain Sunflower went silent, Felix was left with a deep frown and quite a disgruntled expression. Peaceful my ass. In his ideal vision, he planned on coming here, bribing elementals with food, and training all of his manipulations and spells for the next thousands of years in absolute peace. Yet, his ideal vision had crumbled on his first day here at the notion that the planet he chose was in deep water in terms of conflict. Felix shouldn't really be blamed on this matter since the propaganda span by the Elemental's representatives in the Alliance made them seem like the friendliest and most peaceful race in the universe. This would drive anyone to assume that the galaxy would be voided of conflict. You were really duped. Asna chuckled at his misfortune. Based on Chief Cloverus' words, 
it seems like only the water people will be interested in welcoming me without strings attached. Felix rubbed his eyelids, I will have to get myself involved deeply with other tribes if I wanted to train my other elements. Am I really allowed to join such native battles as an outsider? Felix asked, hoping for a rejection. You are the first outsiders we have, so there isn't really any rule about it. Chief Cloverus added, plus, I doubt Elder Stravi will care about it. I do think he should. Bodadai bragged, Boss is one of the strongest fighters in the Alliance. If he joined those wars, they will be ended on the same day. Chief Cloverus and Chief Tess Sunflower glanced at each other and then at the irritated and slightly embarrassed Felix before chuckling simultaneously. Ow! Felix elbowed Bodadai in a swift moment before trying to make amends for his reputation, please don't mind him, he doesn't know what he is talking about. Haha, <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. Chief Tess Sunflower smiled gently at the wincing Bodadai and advised him with good intentions, if you want to survive on our planet, it's best that you forget everything from your home. What do you mean? Bodadai changed his attitude after realizing that he must have spoken too rashly. Elemental strength depends heavily on their consciousness prowess and elemental manipulation. In terms of consciousness prowess, all the chiefs on this planet were born out of environments that stretched for thousands and thousands of kilometers. Since our age is relatively much higher than the outsiders, our consciousness prowess continued to grow until we could be considered posing a serious threat to even primogenitors in our territories. Chief Cloverus got closer to Bodadai's face and said calmly, so unless you make your masters fight your battles, you can forget about defeating a single chief on this planet. Bodadai was forced to swallow a mouthful and dread as his entire world had been flipped upside down at the chief's statements. Even Selfie, Noah, and Olivia were somewhat taken aback as they always assumed that the primogenitors were the strongest beings in the universe. Yet now, they hear that it would be hard for them to deal with the chiefs on this planet, it was too hard to swallow. Don't be giving us those looks. Fenrir said expressionlessly, those chiefs merely have a close consciousness prowess as us, making it impossible to defeat them by using our spiritual pressure. He is right. Chief Tess Sunflower nodded, we might be able to match their spiritual pressure, but it doesn't mean that we can defeat them in a normal battle. The only condition that makes it possible to survive their onslaught is if Elder Stravi or Foremother Siasim stripped them out of using their elemental manipulation. That's possible. Olivia exclaimed. Of course it is. Lady Sphinx cleared her doubts composedly, as long as we are in Stravi's celestial body, he has rulership over elements and laws. If he wants, he can disable the sand elemental energy and laws, making it impossible for us to manipulate something that doesn't exist. He can even take it a step further and disable neutral energy to ban us from converting it into elemental energy. This was the true horror of elementals in their own environments as they were considered as nature itself awakening. Even the primogenitors knew that they could not mess with nature since she had a firmer control of elements than them. After all, nature was part of the universe while they were merely normal creatures who got bestowed with those gifts. Sure those gifts turned them into gods, but in front of nature itself? Even the strongest of them all was absolutely hopeless against Foremother Siasim in her territory. Felix wasn't an idiot to enter the Elemental's galaxy before making thorough research from all sources to understand what he was going to be dealing with. So, he already knew that as long as he was in the Elemental's galaxy, it was best to avoid fights with the natives as they were considered supreme in their environments. Isn't that just a god in disguise? Bodadai took a deep breath. It's not far-fetched to call him as such since he holds the fates of everyone on his celestial body. Fenrir agreed calmly like none of this was considered a threat to him. It was for a good reason. The universe is a just and balanced place, we might be considered gods in our own bubbles, but the moment we exit it, we lose almost all of our strength and prowess, making it possible for even you to defeat us. Chief Tess Sunflower confessed with a gentle smile as she eyed Felix and the others. Now it makes sense. Bodadai sighed in relief. 
he really was on the verge of a mental breakdown at the thought that the Elemental's galaxy could easily run down the entire Alliance's territory whenever they desired. Is this why conflicts are happening between the tribes? Felix inquired, chiefs desiring to conquer more territories and expand their consciousness range, allowing them more freedom to exert their domain. That's merely a small part of it. Chief Cloverus nodded in agreement before adding, the real reason is that with more territory gained, new elemental stones mines get created without harming the ecosystem. This allows the tribes to trade for more of the Alliance's food. In the end, it all returns to food. Selfis smiled wryly, feeling a bit uncomfortable with the thought that the elementals were going through so much trouble and even waging wars against each other for mere basic food. I am sorry but I have always wondered. Olivia asked with a curious tone, why don't you guys learn how to cook your own food? I don't think it's hard to learn some of our recipes and recreate them here. Who told you we aren't already doing that? Chief Tess Sunflower smiled, we cook what we can but since we really don't need the food for nutrition but just for the taste, it's hard to rival the wide range of the Alliance's cuisine. Makes sense. Felix understood that it was like this also on Earth and every other planet in the Alliance. One could try his very best to make the best pizza, but it would still not be as great as pizzas made by the Og Italian's chefs. The same applied to the Elementals as no matter how much they tried to copy the Alliance's cuisine, the taste would always be lacking compared to the real deal. Hence, it was best to just trade their useless elemental stones for the best food instead of focusing completely on just making their own food. Honestly, if the elementals were allowed another source of entertainment, they wouldn't have batted an eye on the food. Alas! This was the only thing that could be traded with the Alliance and bring them some sense of joy. Speaking about food, is there a warehouse in the village? Felix shared. We didn't come empty-handed and we hope to repay your hospitality with at least some food. You don't have to repay us with anything. Chief Tess Sunflower smiled kindly, we accepted to be your host without any ulterior motives. I know, but we still insist. Felix stressed, please, just take it as a gift from your guests. Seeing that Olivia and the others seemed to be hell-bent on paying them back, Chief Cloverus could only accept their gifts to not make the situation too awkward, it was bad manners to reject a gift if it meant well. So, the chief and chief Tess took Felix and his companions to the nearest warehouse while they were being followed closely by most of the villagers. Although it seemed quite intimidating to be followed by thousands of different plants and ghosts, no one seemed to be afraid since they always kept a respectful distance. This is a bit too small for what we prepared. Felix commentated as he scanned the wooden warehouse that was as big as a standard house, it was already half full with many containers. Whatever, I will give them the rest later on. Without further ado, Felix beamed giant red and blue metallic shipment cargo containers in front of the warehouse, putting them one after the other until a towering metallic cube was built by them. Felix opened them with his AP bracelet leaving the villagers to have their mouths and eyes wide open at the magnificent sight inside those containers. The children were drawn to the containers packed with colorful candy boxes filled with chocolate bars, gummy bears, skittles, jelly beans, taffy, hard candy, lollipops, mints, caramels, licorice, and hundreds more different sweets. As for the adults, they felt their souls rejuvenated at all sorts of packed-up dishes, ranging from pizzas, pastas, steaks, seafood, tacos, sushi, salads, sandwiches, fried chicken, and to barbecue ribs. This wasn't all as Felix brought with him other types of desire fulfillment such as cigarettes, cigars, pongs, and many different drugs to be enjoyed. He knew that elementals could not be affected negatively by them or get addicted, leaving only the good euphoric side of drugs. It's chocolate. It's chocolate. Finally I can taste the Alliance's heaven-defying fried chicken again. Are those cigars? Holy, I heard they have been banned. L1 Telagoon witnessed the first publication of this chapter on N0VELB1N. Whether it was an old villager or a young one, every one of them was beyond ecstatic by Felix's collection of gifts. I still have more 
but I doubt this warehouse will hold everything. Felix said. This is already too much for us. Chief Tess Sunflower waved her hand in agitation as she stared at the mountain of containers. Is it? Olivia tilted her head in confusion, feeling like she was overreacting over dozens of containers. Believe it or not, this is the largest package of food we have gotten ever. Chief Cloveris said with a faint bitter smile. For real. This news took even Felix by surprise, don't even mention the rest. He isn't lying to you. Miss Monica explained calmly, you must assume that our entire galaxy should be swimming in the Alliance's food since it is an available resource. Olivia and the others nodded in agreement, in their minds, the Alliance would never reject trading more elemental stones for mere food. But, you are failing to account for one point. Miss Monica sighed, the massive time difference between us. Everything clicked in their minds after hearing her response. Before getting interested in the Elementals galaxy, none of them knew about the time difference since the Elementals had done a great job of keeping it a secret. This made them continue assuming that the trade between them and the Alliance was normal. But in reality, having the time difference at a hundred made it impossible for the Alliance to keep up with the Elementals' food demand. After all, a mere year was considered a hundred in the Elementals' galaxy. This implied that by the time the food run out in the Elementals galaxy, not much time had passed in the eyes of the Alliance. To avoid crashing the Elemental Stones market by overflowing it, we have decided to limit the trades to a reasonable number even if it meant our people spending years without tasting the Alliance's food. Miss Monica sighed. Felix and the others understood that if they didn't do so, the Elemental Stones would be diluted in value which would cause the quantity of food traded to reduce slowly with time. Instead of falling for this and getting taken advantage of by the Alliance, it was better for them to be the ones controlling the flow of the Elemental Stones market. This naturally resulted in having not enough delicious food going around in the galaxy, which turned it into a treasured resource. I don't understand, why don't you ignore the Alliance and sell your Elemental Stones directly to the consumers to earn much more coins? Olivia tilted her head in confusion, this will allow you to buy food directly as well from any empire you choose, isn't it much better? It is much better. Miss Monica shook her head, unfortunately, our partnership forbids us from going around the official alliance's trades. They can do that? Aren't you part of the inner circle? We might be an inner circle race, but we haven't signed the same contract as the others. Miss Monica shared the Ten Rulers wanted access to our galaxy or at least establish the UVR's network there. However, our refusal made them consider us as mere business partners instead of actual allies. In other words, even though the Elementals race was an Inner Circle member, their benefits were actually much fewer than Outer Circle races. Even though the Alliance desired their Elemental Stones heavily, it didn't mean that they would allow them to walk over them. Thus, just like the Elementals limited the Alliance's involvement in their galaxy, the Alliance also limited their involvement in their matters. It was a fair trade. Anyway, if you guys desired more food, please don't hesitate to let us know. Felix said as he watched the villagers clamoring with heated looks directed at the containers, knowing that it was mean to keep teasing them like this. As I have already told you, this is more than enough. Chief Tess Sunflower smiled save the rest for your journeys, you will be needing it a lot. For now, how about we show you your lodging? Chief Cloveris remarked. Please. Felix and his companions followed Chief Cloveris through the trees and cottages, leaving Chief Tess Sunflower to handle the distribution of the food to the villagers. It was clear that everyone here had an insane mastery over their consciousness control as they were using strong telekinesis without breaking a sweat. L1 Terry N0V3L hosted the first appearance of this chapter at N0VEL.B1N. When Felix looked behind him, he saw a heartwarming sight of the villagers lining up and receiving their portion of the food with big smiles on their faces. Whenever someone took his portion, he didn't escape or seem afraid of having it stolen. Instead, he went to his nearest villager and invited him to eat with him. Even the kids did the same with their candies and chocolates, creating big groups with various types of candy, 
so each one could taste a different candy. Food might be the only source of happiness to them. Yet, they seem content with whatever they got. Asna commentated. Being content is a virtue that is going extinct slowly in the Alliance. Felix smiled bitterly, knowing that he was also void of such emotion as his ambition and greed made it impossible to be content with his achievements. Those elementals' reaction was a pure example that happiness was correlated with the content of one's possessions and life in general. It didn't matter if one was a king who had everything in his life, if he wasn't content, he would never be as happy as a content underprivileged person. Some time later, Felix and his companions could be seen sitting in a circle on the floor of a humble wooden cottage. Lady Sphinx and Fenrir were sitting on the only available chairs in the cottage, this was Felix's personal cottage and the others were also given their own homes. After he showed it to them, he informed them that there would be a small welcoming party in the village's plaza at midnight, then, he departed, giving them some privacy. I think it's best to spend the next centuries or so in the Emerland Glen village. Felix suggested, Oli and Selfa can improve here and I can learn new space spells. Although Felix was told that he would be recommended to the Third Ocean Queen Merlinia so he could improve his water manipulation, he didn't want to seize the opportunity right now. In his eyes, since he was already here with everyone, it was best to take advantage of the situation to learn as much as possible from Selfie about spatial spells until he hit a hurdle, then, he could switch to focusing on his manipulations. You guys do what you want, I will be taking Noah to the North Pole. Fenrir shared calmly. Are you planning to stay there until he is ready to break through the Origin Realm? Lady Sphinx inquired. I still have no clue if he can even pull it off or not, but getting there mentally and physically is a good start. Fenrir replied. Felix and Olivia couldn't help but frown a bit at the thought of breaking through the Origin Realm. In the Bloodline Integration System, it was extremely straightforward, only those with a great will to transcend their race by devouring the last bloodline integrated would be rewarded proportionally. The rest end up getting killed without another chance to make amends. It might seem straightforward, but in the eyes of most sixth replacement bloodliners, it was nothing but a way to seek early death. After all, something such as will or mental fortitude couldn't be really measured. This made it almost impossible for anyone to be 100% certain about their breakthrough to the Origin Realm. So, only the bloodliners who reached the end of their longevity decide to throw what remained of their lives at a wild chance of breaking through the Origin Realm. Unfortunately, even though all of those bloodliners had lived 10,000 years if not more, and had enough wisdom to be shared for generations, they still ended up failing this step. So, the will wasn't defined by age. It was this difficult for normal bloodliners with mere bestial bloodlines, now, imagine being daring enough to devour a primogenitor's bloodline. I am fairly certain that it's possible for you to help out in the process. Lady Sphinx said calmly as she eyed Fenrir, as long as you can control your bloodline and keep it dormant in the process, it will be devoured without many issues. Only Olivia and Badadai seemed taken by Lady Sphinx's statement. Fenrir, Felix and Noah already knew that there was a great possibility of cheating the breakthrough by utilizing the primogenitor's help. After all, the bestial bloodlines inside the bloodliners were wild and acting based on instinct, making it impossible to conclude the process without a hellish battle. But in the case of primogenitor's bloodliners? There wasn't such an issue. I don't know, that seems cheap and undeserved. Fenrir replied with a solemn tone, if there is one thing I am certain about in this universe, is that actions have an equal effect. I think so too. Felix nodded, if we ended up breaking through the origin realm in this easy manner, I have a feeling that we will be f asteriskied big time in terms of strength enhancement. Felix understood that origin realm was a huge milestone for a bloodliner since it was the time when he legit undergoes a permanent metamorphosis. If it was successful, he emerged as a new race with a human foundation. He felt that the extreme difficulty and challenge were a testament to the universe, that this new race was deserving of his metamorphosis. If primogenitors interfered in the process, it wasn't known if the process would work or not, 
the only thing that Felix was sure about is that his metamorphosis would be undeserving. Well, all of this is still mere speculation. Fenrir said as he patted the silent Noah's shoulder, my boy here has already decided to go through the process without my help. So, the only thing I can do is prepare him for it. Make sure to call us when you are about to go through it. Lady Sphinx said, it will be helpful data for Felix. Everyone here knew that Felix still had one more bloodline in his path, so, he was still far from assaulting the Origin Realm compared to those two. Unbeknownst to them, Felix's situation was quite unique and there were still doubts about whether the next bloodline would be his last or not. The only one to truly find out was by entering the sixth replacement stage and see if his 1% human bloodline was able to accept newer primogenitors bloodlines or tap out like most humans. Until then, everything was mere speculation, which was why Felix and his masters rarely brought out this subject. At midnight, Felix and his companions went to the plaza to join the welcoming village party. It was a lively and boisterous event, full of merriment and revelry. The air was filled with laughter, clinking glasses and the twang of lutes and other musical instruments. Torches and lanterns lit up the cobblestone streets, casting flickering shadows on the buildings and the faces of the merrymakers. In the plaza center, a grand feast was laid out on long tables, surrounded by benches for the guests and villagers to sit on. The villagers dressed in their finest attire, their clothing a colorful tapestry of greens, blues and golds, gathered around the tables to enjoy the food and drink bestowed upon them by their guests. Although the villagers knew that Felix and his companions had their own food stored, they still kept offering them their own shares throughout the feast. Olivia and Selfie ended up crumbling to the villagers' persistence and ate with them. While Badadai was shameless enough to keep filling his stomach with anything his antennas had locked on, forcing Felix to smack him in the head to discipline him. While the villagers were eating their food, Felix couldn't help but feel a bit weirded out as the sight was quite bizarre. Whether the villagers were in their ghosts or actual form, they keep eating the food just like anyone else, chewing it and then swallowing it, making it disappear into the ether instantly. I don't get it. Why don't they just taste the food instead of eating whole? Asna tilted her head in confusion at the sight as well. She felt that the food would be kept for a long time if they simply enjoyed the taste instead of actually eating it. It might not seem obvious, but she understood that the moment the food was swallowed, they literally use their consciousness prowess to erase it from existence, willingly. This just seemed like a waste for a resource that was extremely treasured in their eyes. Indeed. The smartest decision is to taste the food and keep it intact, but those elementals understood that the joy of food isn't just the taste but the whole process. Lady Sphinx answered her, in their eyes, it's meaningless to imitate the tasting PUDs and leave the rest. Plus, this way makes them treasure the taste of the food much more, which is their original purpose. You're right. The only desire that brings them happiness was food and they knew that if they have too much of it on daily basis, it would lose all meaning. Felix and Asna nodded in understanding at her explanation. They knew that the elementals didn't seek the Alliance's food for anything but its divine taste and it would be almost criminal to ruin it with too much quantity. So, even though most of them complain about the lack of the Alliance's food, none of them dared to be stingy when it came to eating it to give themselves the best possible pleasure. Otherwise, they would be truly living a dull life if they ruined the only thing that brought them a true sense of joy in their eternal lives. At dawn, Noah and Fenrir excused themselves from the party and embarked on their journey towards the North Pole. Felix and the rest continued to enjoy the villagers' hospitality until the party concluded with a morning breakfast. The villagers returned to their duties without an ounce of tiredness while Felix and the rest went back to their cottages for a short power nap. As for Lady Sphinx? She left everyone behind and embarked on her own exploration journey, hoping to find new stuff to experiment on. After Felix and the rest woke up from their nap, they went deep into the woods outside of the village, heading towards a personal training ground created by Chief Cloverus. Chief really listened to us and went all out. Felix showed a look filled with gratitude at the sight of their training ground. 
It resembled a peculiar dimensional pocket inside a thick forest as it was a vast empty space of grass field that was surrounded by trees in a circular shape. Inside this grass field, there was a big wooden cottage with a chimney in it and a front board that had Potion Concoction Lab written on it. Naturally, Felix needed his own lab to continue his potion making practice since the UVR wasn't an option anymore. On the other side of the grass field, there was a giant mound with a dark cave at the bottom. Felix could see with his unique vision that the cave was leading to an underground training area. This was extremely helpful for self as Earth runic spells. This wasn't all as there was also a specific area to boost wind elemental energy and also nature elemental energy. You girls really have gotten the best training ground in the universe. Felix chuckled, knowing that with the thickness of elemental energies and the time difference, not a single alliance's training ground would match this one. This isn't all. If you guys require my assistance to boost the elemental energies even more, feel free to call me. Chief Clover's deep stern voice rustled through the trees and was carried by the wind from every direction, resembling the forest talking to them. Are you talking about channeling the elemental energy through us? Felix inquired, remembering what Miss Monica had said previously. Exactly. May I ask how that works? How about I show you instead? Chief Cloveris requested the girls, little ones, please sit on the ground. Selfie and Olivia did as they were told with intrigued looks. Whoosh whoosh. Out of nowhere, a light green aura began to manifest in the air and spin around them akin to a visible breeze. The more it span around them, the darker its color had gotten, making it seem like it was changing its form from a gas to a liquid state. This is nature's elemental energy. Olivia exclaimed with a shocked look as she reached out with her finger to touch the circling green breeze. The moment her finger made contact, her entire body began glowing like it was being recharged. Olivia was forced to close her eyes and take deep breaths as she was feeling absolute euphoria like all of her cells were being massaged simultaneously. Whoosh! Just as Selfie wanted to do the same, the breeze stopped circling around them and began going through them before emerging on the other side and repeating the process over and over again. Thud thud. Both girls ended up falling face flat on the ground with wide smiles and a bit of sexual look that would make anyone misunderstand the situation. How do you feel? Felix inquired with a curious tone. Like a feather being carried by the wind. self mumbled with a hazy look seeming like she was trying her best to keep herself from moaning in pleasure. Is it that good? Badadai wondered out loud as he reached out with his left antenna at the green breeze. Unfortunately, even though the green breeze went through it, he felt absolutely nothing. This is condensed nature elemental energy and only those with its affinity can feel and absorb it. Chief Clover is shared, looks like you girls haven't really absorbed such a pure natural elemental energy before. Your body isn't adjusted to it yet, so you will be acting like this for a couple of years when exposed to it. Bring it on. Olivia murmured with a happy expression, I feel like I can't live without it anymore. Doesn't this remind you of something? Asna chuckled. It was my first guess the moment I saw their reaction. Felix's eyelids twitched after recalling how he was behaving when Asna kept feeding him with purified elemental energy to increase his affinities in the old days. It was the best euphoric feeling in the entire world, unfortunately, he ended up getting used to it with continuous exposure. Now, absorbing purified elemental energy or not was the same. I guess this would have pushed their nature affinity if it wasn't already at 100% dot. Felix remarked. I believe it will push it much higher. Lady Sphinx suggested, this process is more or less like cleansing the body and making it more attuned with the element. So, if they kept being exposed to this condensed nature energy, it will most definitely help them connect with the nature particles much faster. For real. Felix's eyes brightened up a bit, knowing that if it had this much effect on runic spell casting, his elemental manipulations would greatly benefit from it. After all, elemental manipulations depended heavily on affinities and if Felix managed to boost it immensely, he would easily be able to increase his manipulation ranges by insane jumps. 
It was like a cheat way to finally fix his garbage talent when it came to his elemental affinities. Sh asterisk t, it looks like I really need to befriend the other chiefs to make them help me with this. Felix narrowed his eyes dangerously, I can't miss out on such a godsend gift even if it meant getting my hands dirty. Felix planned on spending the next centuries in the Emmerland Glen village to train his spatial spells but at the same time gain more knowledge about the other villages and cities around the world for the sake of finding a way to avoid the wars. But now? He knew that those chiefs might give him a training ground without helping them in their conflicts but they would never channel the elemental energies through him. It was a personal process and obviously, only their friends could enjoy it. Looks like I need to find out everything there is to know about the desert tribes, swamp tribes, thunder tribes, water tribes, and even the gemstone tribes to befriend them. Felix thought. I doubt you need to try hard with the gemstone tribes. Carbuncle said casually, you are an inheritor of the root gemstone. I have already told you that it allows you to control all gemstones whether alive or dead. I doubt he can control the gemstone tribe chiefs. Elder Crocken interjected, you can easily do so but his consciousness prowess isn't as great as those chiefs, so, they will be able to resist his control. Hmm, you're right, I haven't thought about the consciousness difference. Forget what I said, kid. Carbuncle waved his hand and returned to smoking pongs in silence. Felix's eyelids twitched as Carbuncle raised his hopes just to have them crushed in less than a second. Maybe you can't control those chiefs, but they might feel more inclined to befriend you because of your root gemstone. Asna mentioned. Maybe, the only way to find out is by visiting them. Felix dropped this subject as he had no time for empty speculations. He glanced at Selfie and Olivia, who seemed asleep peacefully on the ground, and asked with a solemn tone, Chief, is it possible to learn more about the world's structure? This chapter made its debut appearance via N0V3LB1N. Since this planet was packed with conflicts, Felix was certain that there must be some sort of hierarchy in place when it came to the tribe's prowess. Sure, follow me. It might take a while. Chief Cloverus manifested as a humanoid man made out of grass blades in front of Felix, then, he walked towards the concoction lab while followed by Felix, leaving Bodidai and the girls behind. After they sat down on a small wooden cafe table, Chief Cloverus took a deep breath and looked directly into Felix's eyes. Kid, since your masters have left you here, I feel like your safety is my responsibility. So, whatever you hear about my world, I wish that you stay away from any conflict. Chief Cloverus stressed it's for your own safety. I appreciate you looking out for me, but I am afraid that's not an option anymore. Felix replied with a flat tone, I didn't come here to make friends or live in peace. I came here to get strong enough to bridge the gap between me and my enemies. I will do anything to make it happen even if it means getting nose deep in any conflict before me. It would have been greatly appreciated if Felix could simply get anything that he wanted from this planet without much trouble, but, life didn't work that way. If getting the strength he desired meant getting involved in such conflicts, then he was left with no other option but to accept his fate. After all, his enemies were three primogenitors and the only way to bridge the chasm between them was by taking advantage of every little opportunity before him. As you wish. Chief Cloverus nodded slightly in approval at Felix's conviction and began explaining to him the invisible hierarchy of his world. We might seem free as elementals, but there is always someone above us capable of dictating and controlling our lives as he desires, it is for a good reason. Take my forest as an example. As the forest's consciousness, I am in control over every elemental awakening in my body. Whether it is a tree, a rock, a pebble, a mushroom, a flower, or what else. I have absolute control over them which means I can kill them and just as easily revive them since they are part of my consciousness in reality. Even revive. Felix was quite stunned by this. He always wondered about this particular situation of elementals awakening their consciousness while already being part of a larger body that awakened his consciousness. Now, it was clear that they were somewhat considered as part of a larger consciousness. 
This entailed that they really never die but just return to being part of the main consciousness and he will decide whether to revive them or not. Honestly, it was quite freaky since it implied that a sunflower could awaken her own consciousness but in reality, she was still controlled by the sunflower field's consciousness, who was controlled by the forest. Just like I am considered as the main consciousness of everyone living in my forest, I am also merely a part of King Valdher's consciousness. Who is that? It's this continent's consciousness, who have absolute control over every consciousness awakened on his land. Chief Cloverus continued, in our world, there are ten kings and seven queens. All of them are at the top of the food chain with authority over everyone but the Cosmic Elders. Cosmic Elders? Felix inquired, are you referring to Elder Stravi and the Moons? No, just the Moons. Chief Cloverus explained, Elder Stravi is considered the Supreme Elder and he is above the Cosmic Elders and the rest in terms of authority since all of us are mere parts of his main consciousness. This is really complex but at the same extremely straightforward. Felix rubbed his eyelids, based on your own words, chiefs can be considered at the bottom of the hierarchy only above the myriad of elementals born in their lands. Yet, those chiefs can be considered as almost having consciousness prowess equal to primogenitors? What about the others? Felix smiled wryly, this is just too scary, to be honest. Scary? You have yet to see anything. Chief Clover is chuckled. Our entire solar system is being controlled by the astral goddess follower, Elder, our sun, and source of light. Our Supreme Elder's consciousness is merely part of hers just like the rest of the planets in our solar system. Before Felix could take a deep cold breath, Chief Cloverus continued on, even our sun Elder is nothing but a mere follower of the astral goddess Lunar Aura. She is the main consciousness of all the stars in our galaxy. Just like her. There are many other elemental gods and goddesses with various ranks among them depending on the size of their main consciousness and the number of followers. Even those gods and goddesses, who are greatly respected and revered, are merely parts of one singular main consciousness. Chief Cloverus asked Felix calmly, can you guess it? For Mother Siasim. Felix said the words with great difficulty as he felt like he wasn't worthy enough to utter her name. Before. He felt like Foremother Siasim was somewhat at the same level as the primogenitor since he never really met anyone stronger than them besides the Unigens. But now? He started to realize that Foremother Siasim was a different monster who shouldn't even be put at the same level as primogenitors. This was the reason why Foremother Siasim never had an ounce of fear at the primogenitors when they ganged up to invade her body, in her eyes, they were nothing but mere mortals similar to the rest of races. It wasn't really surprising as she had absolute control over all laws and elements in her celestial body compared to the primogenitors, in addition, she lived far, far longer than any of them. I didn't tell you about this to scare you or glorify our foremother. Chief Cloverus tightened his hand on Felix's shoulder and uttered with a solemn tone, I shared all of this to make you understand one crucial and important fact. Whether it's an elemental flower, a tribal chief, or a celestial black hole, we don't die, and we will never die as long as Foremother Siamim is alive. But... But I can. Felix continued the rest of his sentence with a deep breath and a somewhat wavering look. That's right. Chief Clover aside him calmly, so, are you still interested in joining our never-ending conflicts between true immortals? Felix would be lying if he said that he wasn't a bit hesitant. Who could blame him? It was one thing to join a conflict that could be ended and another that would last for eternity. The worst part, he was the only one risking his life while the rest of the elementals would easily be revived no matter how many times he slew them. It's not as easy as it seems. Elder Crocken mentioned, they might be able to be revived, but it doesn't happen instantaneously. The bigger the consciousness, the more time it takes for it to be revived. Ask him he will tell you the same. Felix asked Chief Cloverus about this and to his surprise, he agreed with Elder Crocken's statement. May I ask how long it takes on average? Felix inquired. It's a couple of years for the little elementals. As for the chiefs? It might take them a couple of millennials or more. 
I see. His response had gotten rid of Felix's hesitation immediately as he realized that the conflicts might be never-ending, but the battle's results mattered in the short term. This would help him show his support and at the same time train peacefully instead of continuously fighting. L1 Terrari N0V3L hosted the first appearance of this chapter at N0VEL.B1N. Can I know about the tribal structure and the current ongoing conflicts related to my elements? Felix asked with a solemn tone, making Chief Cloverus understand that he had made up his mind to get himself involved. So, he didn't bother to change his mind again and gave him what he asked for. On King Valdher's overreaching landmass, there are more than fifty tribes as large as mine. Those tribes are split between peaceful and conflict-bound. My tribe is considered peaceful since we are on the far northern side of the continent, bordering the Third Ocean in an empty landmass and multiple lakes. Since I am disinterested in expansion and the lake's elementals are the same, we do not have any issues with each other. Almost all the tribes near the edges of the continent are as peaceful as us. However, the same doesn't apply to the tribes near the middle. Why? Felix frowned. It's because of no other than the volcanic lord Hesha's and his ever-expanding tribe, the Scorchlanders. Chief Cloverus sighed. Don't tell me this tribe is expanding in all directions from the center of the continent. Felix raised an eyebrow in surprise. It is and also winning at it. Seriously? They are that strong. Felix was shocked as he believed that shouldn't really be possible since the chiefs could easily gang up on the invader and stop his advances. Lord Hesha's is considered the strongest chief in the entire world, making him earn the title Lord unlike us. Chief Cloverus shared, he earned this title after he led his tribe to conquer more than ten tribes around his territory. Because he is commanding magma, lava, fire and earth elements with his tribe people, they have the greatest destructive power as elementals. Forest, lakes, deserts, mountains, swamps, or river tribes, nothing can stop their destructive advancement in terms of elements. Chief Cloverus smiled wryly as for using our consciousness prowess. His expansion helped him triple the size of his territory, which increased his consciousness prowess immensely, making it impossible for any tribe chief to stand against him alone or with allies. No wonder there were active volcanic chains and lava rivers spanning for thousands of kilometers in the middle of the continent. Asna commentated after recalling what Felix saw from space when he glanced at their continent. It was quite a sight to behold as it resembled hell on land, yet, none of them thought much about it at that time. I don't understand, if he kept conquering territories and destroying tribes, what happens to them? Felix knitted his eyebrows. He was just told that everyone was capable of being revived, but, how would an elemental be revived if his entire territory was already devoured and had its environment completely terraformed? Naturally they are gone until the day their environment gets established again. Chief Cloverus answered him, without it, they can't be revived, that's why the tribes try their very best to protect their chiefs since he was the only one who must not die. But, you shouldn't really think too much about this since each tribe has a vast territory and it's impossible for Lord Hesha's to expand his territory at a rapid pace. This meant most tribes end up falling after thousands of years if not more. Felix understood that he was talking about the terraform aspect of the war, in other words, no matter how strong Lord Hesha's was, his prowess could be only exerted on his environment. It wasn't easy in the slightest to create new volcanoes, lava rivers and an entire natural volcanic system. Since he was expanding in all directions, it was more or less a slow crawl which helped the endangered tribes use everything they had to block his terraforming attempts and his tribe's invasion. Unfortunately for you kid, the Desert Tribe Chief Xander and Swamp Tribe Chief Drogath are currently fending off the Scorchlanders' invasion attempts, if you want their assistance, you are bound to lock horns with the Scorchlanders. Chief Cloverus said. SH asterisk T. Felix already had a feeling that some of his needed tribes must be in direct conflict with Lord Hesha's and his unstoppable aggression. I don't think it's so bad. Asna mentioned lazily. No one is expecting you to defeat Lord Hesha's or his tribe, as long as you offer good contributions to the wars, 
you will befriend them and get what you want. Whether they win or lose isn't really your problem. While a snus take was a bit cold-blooded and shameless, it did make a lot of sense. This was a new world where horrific monsters almost as powerful as primogenitors were in abundance, Felix would be foolish to commit completely to helping those tribes win. So, it was best to put himself in the best possible image and dip after he get what he wanted regardless of how bad it sounded. You're right. The old Felix would have absolutely rejected Asna's suggestion since it was an immoral act to take advantage of someone who put faith in you, but this was the new Felix. The new Felix had only two goals in his mind, slaying the darkened faction and reviving his people, he had no time to wholly invest in other people's problems. How about lightning and gemstone tribes? Well, Thunder Tribe Chief Zoltan isn't really in a conflict. I believe he will reject your visitation simply because he is an asshole. Chief Clover is stated, even if he accepted you by gifting his tribe food, he will most definitely ignore your existence. On the other hand, Mountain Crusher's tribe are secluded elementals and rarely interact with other elementals. I believe it will be difficult for you to get their approval even through food. I understand. Felix rubbed his eyelids with a weary expression already feeling exhausted at the thought of dealing with each tribe and their chief personally. But, if he wanted the best training possible, he had to get their friendship one way or another. Thank you so much for your time and information. Felix stood up and bowed his head in gratitude towards Chief Cloverus, I don't want to hold you any more. Don't mention it. Chief Cloverus patted him on the shoulder and broke into a pile of grass on the chair before the wind came along and carried them back to the field. So, what are you going to do now? Asna inquired. I will stick to my original plan. Felix answered with a solemn tone, I will spend as much time as possible here while gathering more information about those four tribes and Lord Hesha's tribe. Which tribe will you visit first? I will start with the easiest of them all. Felix replied, I will visit the Oceanic tribes in the Third Ocean since I will be recommended by Chief Cloverus. If I managed to get close to one of the Oceanic chiefs, my water elemental manipulation would easily catch up with the rest and even surpass them in no time. With better water manipulation, it will be much easier to handle the Scorchlanders tribe. Felix was already told that Elder Stravi never interfered in those conflicts unless there was just too much destruction. This made him understand that his nuclear abilities and weapons were banned and if he dared to use them, Elder Stravi would make him regret it. To avoid ruffling the wrong feathers, Felix would rather be on the safe side and use less mass destructive abilities. Felix, come on out, it's time to train. Abruptly, Olivia's cute voice resounded from the window far away. Felix glanced at the window for a few moments before uttering under his breath, asshole, conflicts, or secluded. Regardless of the situation, I am not leaving this world without boosting my elemental manipulation range to a hundred thousand kilometers for each element. I will make sure of it. With one last statement filled with unwavering determination, Felix exited the lab and gathered with his companions to finally start his Iron Man training. While Felix was learning a new lesser spatial spell with Selfie and Olivia, he had no clue that the news of his party's arrival and food bestowal had already traveled across the entire globe. This caused multiple different emotions to arise in almost all the tribes after they heard of the food's quantity given. Some were regretful for not fighting harder to host them and some outright expressed their desire for their food. If I knew they will be able to smuggle this much, I would have made them stay on my territory. Lord Hesha's expressed with an irked tone as he sat on a throne made out of boiling magma. Unlike Chief Cloverus or Chief Tess Sunflower, his humanoid form was truly fearsome and harrowing as he was standing over seven meters tall with a muscular build. His body was comprised of molten rock and ash, with tendrils of blazing magma constantly pouring off his form. His skin was rough and jagged like a field of cooled lava, with bursts of flame occasionally bursting forth from his pores. Lord Hesha's face was inhuman and demonic, with a wide, gaping maw filled with razor-sharp black teeth. His eyes burned with an inner fire, and they seemed to glow with an intense, malevolent intelligence. Father, 
it's doubtful if they would have agreed to stay on our land compared to the breezy and peaceful northern forest. Zaitos smiled wryly as he looked around him. He didn't need to add more to prove his point as the hellish appearance of the throne chamber backed him up. It might be breathtaking and beautiful in the eyes of the volcanic folk but in the eyes of outsiders? It was just as intimidating as Lord Hesha's. The walls were sculpted from flowing rivers of molten rock, with veins of blazing red and orange running through them. The heat in the room was insanely intense, making the air thick and hard to breathe, and the light from the magma cast flickering shadows across the walls. The floor of the chamber was a roiling sea of lava, with bridges and walkways made of cooled rock providing the only path through. Above the throne, there hung a massive, blazing chandelier, casting light across the room and providing a crown-like halo to Lord Hesha seated upon the throne. Many humanoid volcanic folks sat at the side of at the sides of the throne chamber while having the same expression as Zytos, the right hand of Lord Hesha's. SH asterisk T, if I wasn't born out of a lava river, I wouldn't want to be here. Likewise, it's always damn hot, why doesn't have to be always hot? I just want to feel a light breeze on my rugged skin. What skin? You are a boulder's consciousness, get a grip already. Boom. Silence, you punks. Lord Hesha's banged the throne's arm with his fist, crushing it instantly into fragments, causing lava to spill everywhere. Seeing that everyone had stopped whining, Lord Hesha's ordered them with a cold tone, I want you to get me as much information as possible about those outsiders. Since they can afford to gift so much food to the Emmerland Glen village, they must have smuggled a greater amount. When Elder Stravi heard about Felix's party visitation, he didn't go into details about their identities when he relayed the news to the tribal chiefs. Since the Alliance had banned smuggling food to the Elemental Galaxy to keep them dependent on their trade, all the chiefs believed that not much food would be brought in by those visitors. So, only Chief Cloveris and Chief Tess Sunflower accepted to host them because of their friendliness. This was unfortunate for the rest of the chiefs and their villages as they had no clue that Felix's authority within the Alliance was already close to the peak due to his status, giving him many perks and benefits. One of the perks of being an inner circle leader was having such rules inapplicable to him personally. So, Felix could smuggle food inside the Elemental's galaxy as long as he was the one entering it instead of sending his subordinate or such. That's why his entire party's food was given to him to smuggle and was returned to them when they lost connection to the network. Should we approach them for a trade or such? Zytos asked. Yes and find out first what they want to make get more during the trade. Lord Hesha's ordered. All right. Get going quickly. Lord Hesha's warned, other tribes must be doing the same, we can't lose the trades to them. On it. They. Initial posting of this chapter occurred via N, 0, Val, B, J, N. Without delay. Zytos transformed his body into a giant flaming eagle and took off through the molten throne chamber's ceiling. Father, what do we do if they rejected to trade with us? E. Avroim wondered with a curious tone. This was the left hand of Lord Hesha's, unlike the rest of the volcanic folks, she resembled a fiery tree with a molten rugged trunk and branches while lava veins coursed through her entire form. She didn't have leaves but her branches were illuminating brilliantly making her appear quite mystical and breathtaking. She was the consciousness of a unique forest that existed only on the surface of active volcanoes. What else? Lord Hesha's narrowed his eyes coldly and uttered, nothing. No one seemed surprised by his answer as they knew that their father might be insanely strong, but he was hopeless in front of Elder Stravi. Since Felix's party was guests on his celestial body, he naturally wouldn't let anyone bully them or steal their stuff. Honestly, even if he didn't deter Lord Hesha's and his people, they still wouldn't be able to cause much trouble for Felix and his party. After all, there were more than five tribes with vast territories between them, stretching to hundreds of thousands of kilometers. This meant that unless Lord Hesha's and his tribe conquered those tribes, there was no way they could threaten them. After all, if they exited their environment, they lose almost 90% of their strength and consciousness prowess. 
That's why your job is to get more information about them, I want to know everything. I will handle it, father. E. Avroim promised with a sweet voice. Since there was no network in the Elemental's galaxy, gathering information was a difficult task. In fact, if it wasn't for Elder Stravi opening his mouth and telling everyone about the midnight party in the northern forest to show his appreciation of Emerland Glen's hospitality, no one would have known about gifted food. While his intentions were pure, he ended up creating quite a bit of trouble for Felix and his party as now everyone knew that they had managed to smuggle food without trouble. Fortunately for them, this was the only thing that he spoke about and he didn't blabber about Felix's party goals or such. This was another annoying thing about living in an environment that was alive, there was absolutely no sense of privacy as everything was observed and heard. One year later, Felix could be seen standing on one finger on top of the grass mound while wearing nothing but tight blue shorts. The cold breeze was blowing on his face and hair but Felix neither budged nor opened his closed eyes, sweat kept pouring from his forehead and fair skin, entailing that he was doing this for a very, very long time. After staying like this for a couple of moments, Felix snapped his eyes wide open and uttered, Elktrophied poisonous sandstorm. Whoosh whoosh. In the blink of an eye, a giant golden runic hex emerged in the sky above the mound, causing Selfie, Olivia, and Bodadai to glance at it from far away. Here he goes again. Olivia murmured as she eyed a gigantic sandstorm emerging from the golden hexagon, engulfing the entire mound and blowing strong wind through the trees. Yet, what was unique about this sandstorm was the fact that it was somewhat purplish in color and had visible thick lightning bolts coursing through it. It was an unnatural marvel created by combining three elements for a single ability. It might sound like nothing special, but everyone watching knew that it was extraordinary. That's because Felix had created this ability by casting a spell and two different elemental abilities simultaneously, something that wasn't being done by anyone. Yet. Felix wasn't done yet. Here goes nothing. Felix took a deep breath and uttered again, teleportation. Without delay, a magnificent brilliant grey runic hex emerged above the golden hex, before Selfie and the rest could react, the sandstorm disappeared after a sudden flash of light, returning the training area back to its peaceful environment. Oh! He finally did it! Olivia exclaimed with a happy expression as she looked above her and saw the sandstorm raging in the sky and dissipating the clouds everywhere. Double spell runic casting plus double elemental casting while under non-optimal conditions. He might claim that he isn't talented, but he really has no idea how gifted he is. Selfa smiled charmingly as she watched Felix wipe his sweaty forehead after he returned back to his feet. While everyone seemed to be quite excited for Felix and his success, he didn't even break a smile. He merely glanced at the electrified poisonous sandstorm and uttered with a flat tone, Not enough. Not nearly enough. Boy, I understand that you are rushing to get stronger to deal with your enemies, but you should celebrate those little wins in your progress to keep your motivation on a high note. Elder Crocken advised with good intentions. He is right. Thor supported. I know, but... I just feel like everything I learn pales heavily in comparison to primogenitors. Felix sighed at the thought that the Darkens could kill him with merely their spiritual pressure. You will get there eventually. Hormongondra stressed. The debut release occurred at NOV 3 LB, J, N. I don't know, I just have a feeling that even if I reached their strength and had the same elemental manipulation as them, it will not be enough to slay them. Hormongondra and his masters understood what he meant, they also knew that it would be impossible for Felix to slay the Darkens with his current set of elements and abilities. After all, Hormongondra, Thor, and Fenrir had failed to kill those three even though they spent billions of years mastering their elements. What would be different in the case of Felix if he mastered poison, lightning, or other elements? They might allow him to pose pressure on them but not nearly enough to actually kill them. Felix glanced at his tightened fist as he murmured, I need more, I need something that can ensure their death, all I can think of is the void domain or similar powerful abilities. I still haven't found a method to let you possess void domain without messing with your entire DNA structure. Lady Sphinx shared, so, 
you should forget about it for now. I see. Kid, don't get ahead of yourself. You are still young and have a great future. Carbuncle advised as he blew smoke rings, your target shouldn't be the Darkens but to reach Origin Realm and see how the situation develops from there. If you keep putting the Darkens as your targets, your training mentality will get affected negatively as everything you do will seem useless even if it wasn't. When Felix thought about it, he realized that he was indeed heading to a dark path as his mood was getting shitter and shitter each day, especially when he spent an entire year and had yet to master a single new spatial spell or make any huge and noticeable development. In the past, he didn't really care about his progression speed, but now that his heart was burning with undying hatred at the Darkens, it made it impossible to not feel disheartened by his slow progress. If things kept developing in this manner, forget about spending thousands of years here, Felix would most likely tap out after a mere decade. Always remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Hormongondra said with a stern tone. Felix took a deep breath to regain control over his rising negative emotions and said, Thank you, masters. Boy, you have another visitor. Suddenly Chief Clover's solemn voice echoed in the training ground. Who is it this time? Felix frowned. In the past year, his training had been interrupted too many times to count by those visitors from the nearby tribes. All of them wanted one thing, trading for his food. At first, Felix was open-minded and didn't care much about trading with them since he brought with him a hundred billion coins worth of food stocks, but, with each trade he made, another tribal representative appear before him. Every time it happened, his training had to be stopped to entertain them since he didn't want to leave a bad impression as it might affect his plans to get close to his desired tribes. To make matters worse, his desired tribes didn't even bother to visit him. Fortunately for him, he was waiting patiently for this visitor. It's Scorchlander's representative and right hand of Lord Hesha's. Chief Clover is informed. They actually came. Felix's frown turned instantly to a faint smirk. He wore his clothes and swiftly teleported back to the village hall without much of an issue. He already mastered his teleportation skill to take him wherever he wanted as long as he had visited the place before, and it wasn't far enough to consume his entire spatial elemental energy. Are you sure about this? Asna asked while playing chess with Candace. Well, an opportunity presented itself, it will be foolish of me to not take it. Felix replied. After Felix realized that everyone must have been informed about his food stock, he knew that the Scorchlanders were going to be visiting him sooner or later like the others. So, he devised a plan that might help him earn friendships with the Meyer Marauders and the Desert Wind Clan. In a short while, Zytos landed near the village hall after being led by Chief Cloverus. He switched his form back to a humanoid molten golem and made sure that his flowing lava was closed shut with his body to not cause damage to the village, then, he manifested his ghost form and used it to follow Chief Cloverus. After he climbed the stairs, he saw that Felix was waiting for him at the door with a polite welcoming smile. Sir Felix? Zytos inquired with a curious tone. Yes, nice to meet you, sir. Zytos and the pleasure is mine. Zytos smiled politely as well, not seeming like he was putting any air. I assume you are here for a trade as well. Felix jumped straight to the subject, knowing that most elementals were known for being long-winded in their conversations due to their lack of time sensitivity. Indeed. Zytos laughed, I guess you have been continuously assaulted by other tribes. It wasn't so bad. Felix smiled, I made sure to send everyone back without disappointment. I am relieved to hear so. Zytos showed a brightened look. He spent an entire year flying non-stop from his tribe to the northern forest, it would have been tough for him to return empty-handed. Please tell me what you desire, Sir Felix. Zytos offered first, we have the purest fire, magma, and earth elemental stones. In addition, Many unique natural treasures are related to those elements. I know that you outsiders use those stuff significantly. The other tribes offered the same stuff in their trades since there wasn't really anything else that they can give out. 
Hmm, well, to be honest, I don't really have affinities of any of those elements, so they are quite useless to me. Felix answered while scratching his head awkwardly. Are you sure? Zytos turned a bit nervous as he knew that if Felix didn't want their stuff, even if the trade went through, they wouldn't get much food. Well, I might not need your stuff, but I won't be the bad guy and send you empty-handed. Felix smiled kindly and said, Just forget the trade, I will give you a couple of containers as a gift. Think of it as me paying respect to the great Lord Hesha's. You are so kind. Zytos might be delighted with Felix's proposal, but he still knew that his father wasn't going to be pleased with this quantity. After all, their tribe had at least ten times the number of elementals compared to the others, this meant not everyone was going to get a portion. I hope it's settled. Felix smiled as he asked, Are you going to pick them up by yourself or use Elder Stravi help? Wait a moment. Zytos requested, I really appreciate your gift but can I contact my father and see if he might have something to continue our trade? Sure, I don't mind. Felix permitted with a hidden glint. Thank you so much. Without further ado, Zytos returned to his molten body and initiated a connection with his father through a consciousness link. Since he was part of Lord Hesha's main consciousness, it was possible to link themselves and communicate regardless of the distance. What? Father, I have met with the outsider and he rejected our trade because he has no use for the things we can offer him. Just as Lord Hesha's was about to snap, Zytos continued on, but, he has agreed to gift us a couple of food containers as a sign of respect. Um, I see, I see. Lord Hesha seemed somewhat pleased with Felix's attitude after hearing that. I reached out to see if you can suggest something else to offer him since it's not worth it to bring back just a couple of food containers. Good thinking. Lord Hesha said, since he doesn't require elemental stones or natural treasures affecting elemental affinities, tell him if he is willing to trade a thousand containers for an eternal firestone. Are you sure, father? It takes a lot of time for each firestone to be burrow. Shut up and do it. Lord Hesha's chided with a cold tone, what's the point of having them if they are useless to us? Zytos swallowed the rest of his sentence and relayed the news to Felix. Eternal Firestone for a thousand containers? What's that? How can it be worth this much? Felix was bewildered by their new offer as it wasn't part of his plan. His original plan revolved around rejecting all of the Scorch Later's trades until there would be nothing left to offer. When things reach this stage, Felix would go with the trade but for a future favor from Lord Hesha's. Knowing that Lord Hesha's was a respectful figure, this favor was going to help him greatly in his mission to befriend the desert and swamp tribes. It is a great treasure as it enables you to possess a burning heart capable of absorbing neutral energy around you and burning it as a fuel to feed all types of your energies. You can consider that it turns your heart into an engine, which will help you avoid anything related to exhaustion. So. Zytos eyed him with a hopeful look, it's a good deal right? Right. Felix ignored his nervous blabbering as his mind was still processing the description of such a godly magical treasure. No exhaustion, burning neutral energy as a fuel, what the hell is this thing? In Felix's eyes, this was an absolute banger of a treasure that he didn't even know existed in this universe. Burning neutral energy as fuel. Interesting, I have never heard of such treasure or effect before. Lady Sphinx remarked with an intrigued tone. This galaxy is really a marvelous place. Elder Kraken expressed, not a single natural treasure has been found to convert neutral energy outside of this galaxy. Yet, those volcanic folks have no issues trading one with ordinary food. Shit, shit, shit. The more Felix heard his master's remarks, the more he desired to have this natural treasure, even if they didn't say anything, he wanted it dearly since the notion of having his exhaustion wiped away was too good to give up on. However, he understood that if he agreed to the deal, he wouldn't be able to get a favor from Lord Hesha's, after all, it would seem too fishy to accept the treasure as well seeking a favor. The initial posting of this chapter occurred via N, 0, Val, B. J, 
N. How do I play this to get both? Felix used his lightning quick reflexes to brainstorm a method that would enable him to secure both before Zytos got alerted. He went through many methods but he kept shutting them down as he knew that Lord Hesha's was too smart to not see through them. In the end, Felix realized that he was left with only one risky method. Eternal Firestone, uh, it sounds good, but I already have no issues with my energy management. Felix replied awkwardly, plus, I don't know if this item is going to harm me in the long run. I am just a human and I don't have either fire affinity or fire immunity. Zytos hastily tried to promote his treasure after hearing Felix's response, however, nothing he said managed to change Felix's attitude toward this trade. Just as he planned to deliver the news to Lord Hesha's, Felix interjected with a humble tone, I feel bad about rejecting your attempts like this. How about you connect me with Lord Hesha's? We might work something out together. Uh, okay, give me a second. Zytos knew that he couldn't reject Felix as it would cause their trade to collapse immediately. So, he contacted his father and narrated all the points that were brought up by Felix to reject their treasure. When he was done, Lord Hesha's took over his consciousness forcefully to speak with Felix before Zytos could even tell him about it. Suddenly, Zytos' entire form and facial features remained the same but his expression and tone had changed drastically, even the atmosphere inside the village hall seemed to have gotten stiffened and hot like they were transported into a sauna. Outsider, this is Lord Hesha's speaking. It's an honor to meet you, my lord. Felix bowed his head respectfully. Hmm, I dislike beating around the bush, so tell me what you want exactly to get this over with. Lord Hesha said with an indifferent tone. Lord, I really want to make a fair trade with your tribe, but the treasures offered haven't moved me. Still, I am willing to get the eternal fire stone for a thousand food containers. Felix smiled politely, consider it as a start to a friendship. Lord Hesha's remained silent at Felix's statement as he merely kept staring at him expressionlessly, making it impossible for Felix to know what was going through his mind. Still, Felix was a veteran con artist and had complete control over his emotions, making Lord Hesha's notice not an ounce of deceit in his eyes. I don't need giveaways. Lord Hesha's remarked with a flat tone, since you aren't interested in our treasures, I will accept the trade and I will owe you a favor. However, you will have to throw an extra thousand containers. My favors aren't cheap. Although Felix was ecstatic inside, he showed a somewhat hesitant expression like a large number of containers was a bit too much to swallow. The last thing he wanted was to show that his stock wasn't affected negatively by this trade. Hmm, is he acting or have I asked for too much? Lord Hesha's thought to himself, maybe he didn't smuggle so much. Lord Hesha's might be an extraordinary figure on this planet, but he still wasn't too familiar with or knowledgeable about the Alliance's matters since they were mostly classified. So, he really had no clue about the food's prices or Felix's rich identity, making him assume that he might not have been able to bring too much. Before he could think too much about this, Felix showed a forced polite smile and said, I agree to your terms. Good. Lord Hesha's dropped the previous subject and showed a faint pleased smile at his trade going through. Haha. <laughs> Two thousand food containers will last us an entire month. Zytos celebrated in his mind. Supreme Elder will handle the delivery process. Lord Hesha's eyed Felix calmly and added one last time, don't waste your favor on something useless. Don't worry, you will be surprised. Felix snickered in his mind as he watched Zytos' expression return to normal, marking the departure of Lord Hesha's. Follow me. Felix requested. Felix took Zytos to an empty area in the forest outside of the village and beamed the 2,000 containers on the grass field, creating a humongous metallic colorful cube. Supreme Elder, we are ready for the trade. Felix spoke out loud with a respectful tone. I am also ready to be taken away. Zytos stated as he stood near the containers. In the blink of an eye, the humongous metallic cube and Zytos disappeared out of existence after a bright flash of light. After the flash of light dimmed down, 
Felix noticed a medium-sized rugged orange rock hovering above the grass. It wasn't burning but he could feel an intense heat being released from it. The trade is complete and I have taken the delivery payment. Elder Stravi voice thundered from the sky akin to a deity speaking a new mantra. Thank you, Supreme Elder. Felix bowed in appreciation and walked towards the hovering eternal firestone. He wasn't surprised by the delivery process as he had gotten used to it in the past year after many similar deliveries. At the start, Felix wondered if the elementals had spatial cards or similar items to hold those containers but his inquiries were answered after he realized that Elder Stravi was the playing delivery man for all the tribes. With his complete control over elements and laws in his celestial body, it wasn't surprising, though what was surprising was the fact that Elder Stravi deliveries weren't free. He took only food as payment, making it a luxury for those elementals to abuse his deliveries. That's why Zytos had to fly all the way here but easily teleported himself back to his tribe as they could afford to pay him. Elder Stravi might be a planet's consciousness, but he also desired to enjoy good food like anyone else. He said I need to consume this, did he know that I am able to eat minerals, or is there another method of eating this? Felix spoke to himself as he played with the eternal firestone in his hands. Maybe you should crack it like an egg. Asna suggested after noticing that the firestone seemed to have a hollow interior. Maybe, you're right. Felix shook it and realized that there was something gooey inside of it. So, Felix sat on the ground and used force to cut the upper half of the firestone to make sure that nothing spill out. Ooh, this looks like molten gold. Felix reacted with a mesmerized look after noticing a golden liquefied gooey substance that resembled honey. Despite the intense heat, Felix reached out with his finger to touch the golden substance. Nothing much happened besides his finger feeling warm. Should I taste it first? Felix wondered as he brought his finger next to his mouth and smelled it. Zytos had told him that Firestone was tested on one outsider and nothing wrong happened to him after he was bestowed with its gifts. Still, Felix wasn't too eager to put something in his body without making sure of its safety. After all, Zytos' words couldn't be fully trusted, even if what he said wasn't a lie, that outsider might be from another race that was compatible with this treasure unlike him. Without the UVR, it wasn't possible to do a dummy safety test. What do you think, Master? Felix asked Lady Sphinx. Just eat it. Lady Sphinx said calmly, if it doesn't work, the worst it came to do to you is ruin one of your hearts, you can easily recover it. Felix nodded in understanding and licked his finger, to his surprise, his tasting PUDs were assaulted by a warm sweet taste like he was eating hot caramel. Felix decided to wait a few moments to see how his body would react. In a few seconds, his three main hearts felt slightly warm. So far so good. When nothing seemed wrong, Felix got bolder and picked the firestone with both of his hands. Then, he brought it close to his mouth and began gulping down the golden substance. In less than a few seconds, he finished the whole thing, still not satisfied, he manifested a crystallized spoon and began scraping the inner surface of the firestone. Then, he ate what he gathered, not caring that some pieces of the rugged stone were mixed with the gooey substance. After he made sure that not a single ounce of golden substance was left behind, Felix finally placed the firestone on his lap and burped in satisfaction. Ah, it feels so good. He uttered happily as he felt warmness in all of his hearts. Before he could enjoy the sensation a bit more, Felix noticed a weird orange aura being emitted from his skin, making him seem like he had caught on fire. Whoosh whoosh. Abruptly, the wind around him started rushing in his direction like he was a black hole. The fire aura kept increasing in size and intensity during the process, seeming like it was feeding on the wind or something. But Felix knew exactly what was going on as he could sense everything. Holy, this is happening so fast. He exclaimed in shock as the fire aura kept raging around him, making him resemble a super scion during his transformation. Felix didn't even bet an eye on that as his main focus was on the massive quantity of neutral energy being automatically absorbed by his hearts and transferred into fuel to recover all of his energies. 
whether they were elemental, physical, or mental. Felix was feeling like he was being refreshed from top to bottom. Interesting, it even recovers all of your elemental energies. Lady Sphinx expressed, it's not as fast or efficient as the elemental conversion technique, but it is doing something. In a few moments, the fire aura started to die down until only smoke was arising from Felix's skin like he had just gotten out of a hot shower. Thud. Felix fell on his back with the most relaxed smile he could muster, feeling all of his built-up mental and physical exhaustion ever since the war was completely wiped out. This is the best treasure ever. He remarked as he stretched his limbs all over the grass, seeming like he had just woken up from a long slumber. Is it just me who thinks that your condition isn't normal? You were told that the Firestone turns your heart into an engine to recover your energies, but I see that all of your hearts are under the Firestone's effect. Asna wondered as she scanned Felix's body and saw that all of his hearts were going absolutely wild. I thought so as well. Lady Sphinx shared, the process shouldn't be intense and rapid. If Zytos was still here, he would have been absolutely dumbfounded by the previous sight of the frenzied fire aura around Felix as this wasn't normal at all. I guess the Firestone adapts to each body, which means its true potential isn't kept but only limited due to our body limitations. Felix reasoned after he felt a new level of clarity in his mind. Must be. Lady Sphinx and the others agreed with his conclusion. What if I ate the shell? Felix wondered as he greedily eyed the Firestone's exterior. Zytos might not have recommended it, but he had no clue that Felix was capable of eating and absorbing mineral properties. This was a mineral treasure, which meant it would also feed his dragon mark. I don't see it affecting you negatively. Lady Sphinx expressed. Felix didn't need to hear more as he reached out with his hand and grabbed the Firestone, then... He cracked a piece of it and began munching on it like a biscuit, loving the flavor. After he finished eating the entire thing, he felt a slight warmness in his hearts, which made him a bit pleased. However, the biggest kicker was his physical strength as he realized that he had gotten stronger by at least an additional 3 kbf up to 5 kbf. An entire 25% increase to my second dragon mark. Felix exclaimed excitedly. It's really an amazing mineral treasure. Felix knew that if he wanted to get this kind of boost, he would need to devour a small mountain of elemental mineral treasures. This planet is packed with such treasures and it looks like no one gives a damn about them. Felix narrowed his eyes, I have to start fishing for them in trades even if it meant giving more food. In his previous trades, Felix accepted whatever was offered so he wouldn't be required to give out more food containers. But this situation changed his entire perspective as he realized that some tribes might be sitting on such magnificent treasures and they had no problem with giving up on them for food. By the way, can you control the recovery phase? Asna mentioned. I don't know, I didn't try to stop the process earlier. Felix answered, there is only one way to find out. Felix swiftly returned to his training ground and restarted his training. After a couple of hours of intense training, signs of exhaustion began to appear. However, before those signs could develop even further, a mild version of the same fire aura appeared on his skin. Olivia and the others were baffled when they saw it as it made Felix seem like his body had caught on fire. Felix explained the situation to them and advised them to also seek similar treasures if they were even approached for trade. After he sent them away, Felix started working on controlling the recovery phase, unfortunately, regardless of what he did, it seemed that the process was on a subconscious level, making it extremely difficult to turn it into a manual process. Since it wasn't really a big deal, Felix decided to ignore it for now and focus on his training. With no exhaustion to hold me back, there is no stopping now. Felix cracked his knuckles with a faint determined smirk fully set to train until someone stop him. One century later. Inside an inn within Emmerland Glen Village, Felix could be seen chugging down a giant wooden chalice filled to the brim with alcohol. Chug. 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 The villagers in the inn were banging the tables as they chanted with excited expressions. When Felix finished the drink, 
he lifted it in the air in celebration even though he absolutely felt not a single ounce of pleasure out of alcohol. The only reason he was here and celebrating with the villager was because of his upcoming departure. Felix spent an entire century in Emmerland Glen Village until everyone considered him as one of them. So, when they heard that he planned on going to the nearby Oceanic tribe, they insisted on holding a faraway party. I can't believe it's been a century already. Selfis smiled bitterly, it went by too fast. Not for me it didn't. Badadai burped with a teary look, I am bored out of my mind in this place. I wanna go home. Everyone ignored his whining as he had been doing this ever since the first two decades and now it just became a daily occurrence. Make sure to be safe in your journey. Olivia said with a worried tone, you will be all on your own in a foreign environment. I will be fine. Felix smiled as he patted Olivia, you on the other hand. Don't get too lazy in your training when I am gone. I won't. Felix, are you sure it's time to leave? Selfa caught Felix's arm as she looked at him with a puppy look, if you worked hard, you can definitely master a greater spatial spell in a decade or less. I have made up my mind. Felix chuckled, it's time to focus on my manipulations lest I completely forget how to train them. Although an entire century had passed, Nothing much really happened in it, Felix focused completely on his spatial spells, potion concoction, and elemental techniques. Since he didn't have the UVR, his runic training had taken a great hit. After all, he needed the UVR so his multiple consciousnesses could grind on the same spell over and over again to hasten the mastering process. Without this cheat method, Felix took years to master just one spatial spell which was a nasty hit to his training speed. In addition, his potion concoction also suffered majorly without the UVR as he had to use legit materials in his practice, which made it impossible for him to get better without wasting a sh asterisk load of precious materials. So, he didn't improve too much in this area as he couldn't afford to lose all of his materials just for practice. Still, Felix managed to get a lot of benefits from this century of isolated training, Firstly, he had increased his strength by an entire 110 kbf after hitting the 5th dragon mark and the 11th devourer mark. It wasn't easy as he had to eat on daily basis a huge quantity of natural treasures and also elemental minerals without reaching the point of being forced into slumber. It might have slowed down his advancement in the marks, but he used the time to properly master 10 spatial lesser spells, and many unique elemental techniques that combined those spells with his abilities. However, when he tried to attempt learning greater spatial spells, that's when Felix understood the true horror of mastering complex runes without a monstrous talent like Selfie or his cheat method. That's because the easiest greater runic spatial spell required Felix to write a hundred runic pages to activate it. The instant Felix knew this, he realized that his time here was over and it was better to start his journey to enhance his other manipulations too. With my recommendation and your previous trade with the Cold Lone Island tribe, they will welcome you with open arms. Chief Cloveris advised, however, make sure to respect their culture as they are a bit uptight about it. I will keep it in mind. Felix thanked him with a head bow. He spent 100 years under Chief Cloveris' care and Felix was greatly appreciative of it as he had taught him many things. Are you going to travel through the Void Realm with Nimmo or use Supreme Elder's help? Olivia inquired. Neither. Felix smiled, I am going to travel on foot to expand my horizons. Ever since Felix stepped foot on this planet, he never left the northern forest. He would be a fool to teleport straight to the cold Lone Island tribe and start his training instead of doing some exploration on this magical planet. After spending a few more hours in this faraway party, Felix was escorted outside of the village by his companions and the villagers. He was sitting on Nimmo's back, planning to truly journey across the land and water without using any teleportation ability or such. Take care guys and behave properly. Felix glared daggers at Badadai as he said the last part, making him avoid eye contact with him. Make sure to visit us frequently. Selfie requested. I'm planning to do so. I have yet to be satisfied with my runic advancement. On that final note, 
Felix smiled at his friends and waved them goodbyes one last time before taking off with Nimmo like the wind. Eeeeeee! While Nimmo showed his usual excited reaction to anything related to speed and adventure, his eyes seemed tainted with a bit of coldness in them, a coldness that had never been associated with Nimmo before. It turned out, Felix wasn't the only one who changed in the past century. Although Nimmo was quite fast, they still took more than two hours to finally cross over the northern forest and reach the empty expanse between them and the third ocean. Felix enjoyed the wind blowing on his face as Nimmo kept sprinting on the grass field, heading towards the nearest cliffs. After they arrived, Felix jumped from Nimmo's back and landed at the edge of the cliff. He stared at the far horizon, where nothing but crystal clear blue water was seen. The cold Lone Island tribe is at least five hours away from land even if I swim at my top speed. Felix thought to himself, might as well take my time and explore everything on my path. Without further ado, Felix covered his entire body in his void suit, leaving only his gills in the open. Then, he bent his knees to the limit and launched himself away from the dangerous rocks at the bottom of the cliff. Eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
Felix projected his thought waves as electromagnetic pulse signals in the area, knowing that all the nearby elementals would be able to pick them up and hear him. This was a new electrical ability he mastered in the past century as it was deemed necessary in this galaxy for smoother communications. I am this abyss's consciousness. My body has been inhibited by a school of dawn behemoths. Right now, they are out hunting for food and they will return soon, you better leave before then. Dawn behemoths. Felix frowned, having no clue what creature were those. But, just from their name and the abyss consciousness warnings, it was obvious that they were freakishly dangerous. Although Felix was extremely strong and confident that he could pull his weight around, he still understood that underestimating this planet's life forms was an idiotic thought, especially, marine creatures. Still, Felix wasn't planning to escape as he knew that the risk or the situation the bigger the pay. Elder, will I anger Third Ocean Queen Merlinia if I killed any marine life form? Hmm, I don't know why you are asking that, but you shouldn't worry about her wrath. The Abyss Consciousness answered calmly, it's kill or be killed in her gracious bod, so, each to his own devices. Good to hear, thanks. Felix smirked faintly and continued his journey to the bottom of the abyss. When the elder saw this, he stopped talking to Felix. He already did more than enough to warn Felix, if he ended up dying because he ignored his warning, that's not on him. In other words, no one was going to help out Felix even if they could, as he said, it was kill or be killed. Since an entire school inhibits this place, there must be some natural treasures or minerals untouched here. Felix reasoned as he kept scanning the giant holes, and crevices on the abyssal walls. He knew that non-intelligent creatures eat only what was in their diet, which meant that even if there were many natural treasures before them, they wouldn't bat an eye at them. This must be one of their homes. Felix stopped his dive after spotting a humongous cave slightly hidden between mutated red algae and kelp. Felix added an infrared vision plus to his night vision, allowing him to check if there was anyone inside the cave. Is that them? Are they sleeping? To his surprise, his X-ray vision picked up tens of giant skeletons stacked near each other, they weren't moving in the slightest. Based on their bone structure, they must be undeveloped eggs. Lady Sphinx shared calmly. Makes more sense. Felix agreed as he knew that the Abyss Consciousness wouldn't call those creatures behemoths if they had this size. It's now or never. Knowing that the school of behemoths would return any time now, Felix swiftly dove inside the cave and kept swimming at a careful pace until he reached the end of the cave. Oh dear. Even though he anticipated eggs, Felix still felt chills course on his spine at the size of those bad boys. Just one egg had triple the size of a great white shark. There were hundreds of them positioned on the entire cave walls, making it resemble a beehive, those eggs didn't have hard shells like birds' eggs. In fact, they resembled fish roe even though their size was too uncanny. What kind of monsters can lay such eggs? Eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
The moment he beamed them in his AP bracelet, a sudden tremor shook the ground beneath Felix's feet, almost causing him to lose his balance. Looking behind him, he saw a massive creature emerging from the darkness, towering over him with its gargantuan size. It was a behemoth, with dark, matted skin and eyes that glowed like hot coals in the dim light. The behemoth let out an ear-splitting roar that echoed through the entire abyss and traveled hundreds of kilometers, causing Felix to get propelled by the pressure into the eggs. He bounced off them akin to landing on a trampoline, making him get launched back into the wide-open jaw of the behemoth. The moment Felix noticed the dreadful set of sharp white teeth, he didn't hesitate to cast his teleportation spell. With a brilliant flash of light, Felix disappeared from within the behemoth's mouth and appeared on top of the ocean's surface. Phew, that was a close call. Felix wiped his sweaty forehead as he looked below him and saw more than a hundred of those humongous behemoths gathering around the abyss. Each of one of them had four times the size of a whale, which made their gathering appear even more menacing. All of this for dozens of eggs. Let's hope they are worth it. Without further ado, Felix teleported back to the nearest cliff and beamed one of the rows on the ground, planning to study and hopefully cook it right now. So, he would plan another stealing attempt if they were worth the trouble. Without the UVR, it's impossible to find the best recipe. Felix said out loud as he scanned the transparent rose. It's best if you eat the first one raw. Lady Sphinx advised him, this will help you understand if those rows can provide some benefits. Cooking merely enhances those beneficial effects not create them out of nothing. SH asterisk T. Felix's expression turned a bit revolted at the thought of eating those rows uncooked. Felix was used to going beyond and above for the sake of strength, but this was still a tad too much, especially when those rows are even bigger than dragon's eggs. Stop being a B asterisk TCH and eat it. It's just a big version of caviar. Asna teased. Caviar my ass. Felix mumbled in annoyance as he manifested a crystallized knife and a plate, then, he cut a big piece of the rose and placed it on his plate. The moment he brought the plate near his mouth, he was assaulted by a nasty smell that triggered his gag reflexes. Come on, you have eaten much more disgusting stuff for less. Felix encouraged himself and finally took a huge bite from the gooey transparent red caviar. He swallowed it immediately without bothering to chew it even once. How do you feel? Lady Sphinx asked. Sick. Felix wiped his mouth with a pale complexion like he was just forced to eat dog sh asterisk t. You better eat more then. Felix knew that there was no escaping from this, so instead of prolonging his misery, he decided to use his size manipulation to get this done as quickly as possible. He increased his size to the point the row resembled a chicken egg in an adult's hand, then, he threw it in his mouth and swallowed it whole. After waiting for a few moments, Felix began to feel like his intestine was holding into a flood. It gave me f asterisking instant diarrhea. Felix used his poison manipulation to clean his intestine, knowing that he couldn't afford to reduce his size before doing it. He refused to take a sh asterisk t in the open with his massive size while knowing that many elementals were having their eyes on him. Ha ha ha. Meanwhile, Asna was having the best time in her life as she laughed at his miserable situation. After five minutes of having his intestine filled and then cleaned by him, Felix finally was given a break. Thud. He landed on his back and kept huffing with great difficulty like he was fighting his own demons. When the pain finally went away and he was able to focus on other things, Felix realized that he had gotten a bit stronger physically. He swiftly reduced his size and beamed a physical testing machine. Without an ounce of hesitation, he punched it with everything he got, causing the nearby water waves to get pushed back by the shockwave. 425, 541 bf. Felix uttered with a shocked expression as he read the final calculated number his strength had been increased by a whopping 5,000 bf from a single uncooked row. Jackpot! Felix beamed the remaining rows and looked at them with an ecstatic expression, seeming like he didn't care any more about the horrible taste or the stench. 5,000 bf from one row is really something. Asna asked, 
will you get the same if you eat the rest? Doubtful, such benefits from food lose their properties on the same user faster than anything else consumed. Lady Sphinx replied. Still, Felix wasn't disheartened by the news as he knew that he would be getting stronger either way. Without delay, Felix increased his size again and threw the remaining rose in his mouth at once like he was eating pills. After swallowing everything with a twisted expression, he sat down on the ground in a meditation position, awaiting the monster to awaken in his bowels. Have mercy on me. He prayed to the higher powers as he felt his stomach starting to act up. Fifteen minutes later. Felix could be seen lying on his back with a deathly pale complexion and a horrified dramatic expression. It's over, it's finally over. He spoke with a rugged voice like he had lost it in a session of concert screaming. Whoosh! Before he could do anything to heal himself, the Firestone effect activated and began absorbing large quantities of neutral energy to fuel his swift recovery. In a few moments at best, Felix had returned to his top condition. It better be worth that agony. Felix wished as he prepared to test his new strength at the machine. Boom. With one strike carrying everything he got, Felix pulled back, leaving smoke arising at the red pad like it was struck by a missile. Ting. 440, 500 bf. Felix's grin reached his ears as he read the final calculation. The origin of this chapter's debut can be traced to N, 0, Val, B, J, N. He ate more than 20 behemoths rose and got in return a total increase of 1 5 kbf. In addition to the previous 5 kbf, this entire endeavor had given him a similar enhancement to an entire dragon mark. God knows how much he had to go through to finish each dragon mark. I need more. Felix's eyes turned slightly green as he greedily zoomed on the gathering of behemoths in the abyss. Although he knew that the next Rose Eden would probably increase his strength by merely thousands if not less, but, Felix didn't care at all. In his eyes, even a 100 bf increase was hard to come by at his high level, so, he would never shy down from anything that could help him get physically stronger. I need a plan to steal them without getting myself caught. Felix thought out loud as he kept observing the agitated behemoths. He understood that those behemoths were never going to go hunting together without leaving someone to guard their rows this time. They didn't do this before since no one ever dared to get close to the abyss as their dreadful smell was all over the place, acting as a warning. I have to wait for them to restart their daily activities first. Felix knew that nothing he planned was going to work when there were hundreds of behemoths outside of the abyss and inside of it. Hell! He was certain that the rose caves were occupied as well, making it impossible to teleport inside, do the deed, and escape. Felix wanted to avoid making this messy than it should be by actively fighting the entire school. He knew that he was being watched by the Third Ocean Queen and if he acted too barbarically and aggressively, it would paint a bad image. So, he waited, waited, and waited, after seven days. The Dawn Behemoths finally seemed to have calmed down and began to carry on their daily activities. As expected, many are left to act as guards. Felix frowned after seeing that a third of the school was left behind to guard the Abyss. Instead of making a move, he decided to wait a bit more to see if the numbers were going to be reduced. Unfortunately, the Dawn Behemoths kept operating on a rotation process, where two-thirds of their school go hunting for everyone and the remaining third guarded their home. This isn't working. Felix was done with waiting and knew that he had to make a move even if the situation was still too risky. Nimmo, can you use your lust laws on them? Felix asked. Eeeeeee. Nimmo nodded eagerly. All right, you draw their attention outside of the abyss and hold them down. I will teleport inside and steal what I could. Felix stressed, but... Don't kill them. Eeeeeee. Less excited, Nimmo still nodded in understanding. Without delay, Nimmo blinked above the school of Dawn Behemoths, with their size difference, he resembled an ant standing before a mammoth. Still, Nimmo didn't seem to be scared even a little. He merely smiled wickedly in front of them and manifested the lust law symbol above his head. 
Before the dawn behemoths could react, a flood of pinkish aura was projected rapidly all over the place until the entire abyss was filled by it. Oh! 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 The dawn behemoth's eyes had gotten red as they kept hollering their mating calls. Since two-thirds of the school were out hunting, there was a great imbalance in the female-slash-male distribution in the abyss. This resulted in many male behemoths being left alone, watching their companions doing the deed while they were burning with lust. Since they were still animals, their instincts took over them completely and made them unable to sit through it. So, they resulted to the simplest solution, violence. Boom! Boom! The lonely behemoths smashed their bodies against the lucky ones, forcing them to separate from the females, without an ounce of hesitation, they jumped on the female and continued the process. The females clearly didn't give a sh asterisk t about which one was riding it as long as it got her needs satisfied. Unfortunately, that wasn't going to happen with this sausage fest as the males continued to battle it out, using their sharp teeth, large bodies and whatever weapons were in their possession to win their mates back. Nimmo was merely smiling with dreadful pinkish eyes as he watched this mayhem ongoing, seeming like he was feasting on the lusty emotions in the air. More, more, more. He uttered real words in his mind, a clear indication that his intelligence was already on a human level. Neither Felix nor his tenants had any idea about this, in their eyes, Nimmo was still the lovable cute idiot raccoon. It looked like he planned on keeping it this way for some reason. While this mayhem was ongoing, Felix pointed his finger at the abyss and painted the same image of the cave in his mind. Then, he uttered under his breath, dimensional mirror. Abruptly, a circular wavy grey mirror appeared in front of him, in less than a second, the waves began to ease down and a new scene appeared on its surface, showing the hundreds of rows inside the cave. Before Felix could get too excited, one of the dawn behemoths appeared on the image seeming like it was slumbering next to the rose. Looks like it's escaped from Nimmo's lust laws with its slumber. Felix frowned. He knew that the behemoth would definitely wake up the moment his foot stepped inside the cave even though it looked like it was out of it. The abyss consciousness said that they had found me through echolocation, so, even a needle drop will most likely wake it up. Felix planned on using this new spatial spell to teleport himself inside the cave and pick up as many rows as possible before using the same mirror to escape. But now, he knew that his plan was doomed to fail. If you simply don't need to make noise, how about you pass your arm through the portal and beam those rows in your spatial card? Asna suggested lazily. N0 Vel underscore by and hosted the premiere release of this chapter. That might work. Felix approved of her plan, knowing that the dimensional mirror spell allowed him to create an invisible spatial portal that could be seen only by those with spatial detection or such abilities. Unlike normal teleportation, this dimensional portal could stay up for as long as Felix had fuel for it, allowing him to teleport anything and anyone in it. Without delay, Felix held his breath and tensed his arm to make sure that he wouldn't even make the water vibrate as much. Then, he pushed it through the mirror, feeling an instant coldness from the depth of the ocean. Felix waited for a few moments to see if the behemoth was alerted. When it didn't move an inch, he began beaming the nearest rose to his spatial card. Although the rose broke into blue particles during the process, there wasn't any noise. He he he, it's working. Felix grinned widely as he kept beaming one row after another without needing to even be in the vicinity. Spatial cards worked on anything without life. So, Felix made sure to prioritize only the rows in their early developments. Still, he managed to get himself a good haul. Oh. Oh oh oh. Just like most animals, the behemoths finished their mating process in two pumps, managing to all get a piece of the pie even though a war started for some coochie. When Felix heard those sounds, he knew that it was time to call it a quit while he was still ahead. So, he pulled back his arm and closed the dimensional mirror. Just like that, the kidnapping attempt was concluded without any mess or fights, it was as clean as it could be. Without moving a muscle, he beamed those rows on the ground near him, managing to cover hundreds of meters in the surface area. Eeeeeeee! Nimmo blinked on his shoulder and licked his cheek 
seeming like he was asking for praise. Ha ha, good job. Felix chuckled as he patted him, showering him with his usual amount of love. Surprisingly, there wasn't any sense of hidden coldness in his eyes, making it seem like Nimmo was his usual self. Well, I guess it's time to feast again. Felix's at cheeks tightened as he observed the insane amount of rose he gathered. Make sure to leave at least 70% untouched. Lady Sphinx advised, you are eating them uncooked, so you aren't getting everything from them. Wait until we return and find a recipe for them. I understand. Felix was already planning on doing this since he knew that if ate everything here, he would most definitely build in complete immunity to their benefits. Eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
Felix asked after noticing that not many elementals were around compared to the Emerland Glen village. On surface tribe, a couple dozens or less. Chief Tesmoana answered, the majority of our people live in another tribe under the island, you are welcome to pay us a visit down there anytime. Much appreciated. Felix already knew about the duality of the cold Lone Island tribe as he was told about it by Chief Cloverus. Most marine elementals were born underwater. But, there were many islands like this one, which had awakened its consciousness and claimed the territory for itself. Chief Tesmoana was this island's consciousness, enabling her to control water, earth, sand and nature elements due to her situation. Since her territory was expanded freely to thousands of kilometers around the island, this meant that everything awakening in it were her followers. By the way, I am able to breathe underwater just fine. Felix informed, so, I will most likely spend my time underwater to train my water manipulation. Oh, Chief Cloverus has told me about your manipulations. Chief Tesmoana smiled, you don't have to ask me, I will gladly help you train. Thank you so much, you have no idea how much it means to me. Felix felt his heart get put at ease immediately at the sound of that. Don't mention it. Chief Tesmoana said one last time, I will get going now, if you need me, just call my name out loud. Will do. After she left, Felix entered his tropical hut and sat on the bed that was made out of curate palm tree leaves. He looked outside of the window at the breathtaking scenery of the peaceful ocean and the sun nearing the horizon, taking a rest for the day. A smile broke out on its own as he thought to himself, I have a feeling my stay here will be good. Felix was left to his own devices for the next couple of hours as no one came to bother him. Chief Tesmoana might seem kind, but she was a respected figure in the marine world and those elementals wouldn't dare annoy her guest without her permission. Felix didn't do much in those six hours as he kept meditating in the open until sunset, knowing that he needed to be fully geared physically and mentally for the next hellish grind of his water manipulation. It's time to visit the village below. Felix said as walked out of his hut wearing nothing but shorts and having his breathtaking blue hair freed from its braid. Felix might not admit it, but his current mesmerizing appearance truly resembled a mere man. Fortunately for him, no one here cared about his appearance in the slightest, making him feel free to do as he pleased. Without delay, Felix sprinted towards the beach and jumped on a self-created wave. He surfed on it with an easy-going expression as it took him away from the island. Are you heading to the under village? Do you need a guide? Chief Tesmoana inquired in his mind after popping next to him abruptly from the same wave. Much appreciated. Not rejecting free help, Felix allowed her control over his wave, honestly, she could easily take it from him without needing his permission as her elemental control was on par with primogenitors. After putting some distance from the island, Chief Tesmoana controlled the wave to turn into a water bubble around Felix and took him under seas. Just as Felix wanted to tell her about his ability to breath underwater by using his gills, the words refused to leave his mouth after his eyes were completely mesmerized by the most magnificent sight he had seen underwater so far. So pretty. Even Asna and Candace loved it as the underwater village was illuminated with multiple colorful lights coming from neon marine plants of all types and sizes. The elemental houses were situated under those giant neon colorful plants, they were considered as part of the island underwater's body as they were simple caves with nice entrances. While the village was packed to the brim with underwater elementals, there were many peaceful oceanic creatures swimming by without an ounce of fear. This created beautiful and lively scenery even in the supposedly horrific depth of the ocean, which truly caught Felix by surprise. Just like what happened on the upper surface, Felix's presence had brought out a frenzied response by those elementals as everyone knew that he was a spewing food machine. Although Felix knew that his popularity was related to food and that those elementals wouldn't have cared about him without it, he still smiled kindly as he waved his hand at them in greeting. If any of those brats tried to ask you for food, just ignore them. Chief Tesmoana said as she gave a stern stare at the gathered villagers. It's fine, I don't mind that much. Felix still tried his best to keep a good image before Chief Tesmoana 
knowing that her help in his training wasn't really secured yet. His response did its magic as it had pleased Chief Tesmoana to no end. In her eyes, anyone willing to part with precious food in this galaxy was a generous person worth befriending. Unbeknownst to her, all the food that Felix had given or traded so far didn't even touch 1% of his total stock. He came fully stacked to bribe the entire galaxy if it would help him improve his strength. In a short while, Felix was taken further down into the depth of the ocean at his own request. Chief Tesmoana obliged after knowing that he had no troubles with being under the water. Is this good enough? She asked after she reached the darkest place in the ocean, where even sunlight was unable to reach. It's perfect. Felix nodded in approval as he looked around him and saw a couple of empty caves and an empty seabed. It was completely isolated from the village and even most marine creatures wouldn't dare get this deep. If you are planning to make this place your permanent training ground, I will ban everyone from coming here to bother you. Chief Tesmoana shared. Dot the initial instance of this chapter being available happened at N0V3L.bin. That would be great. Felix replied with a grateful tone as he crossed his legs and sat at the seabed. Without much delay, Felix got himself into the zone and began sensing the water particles around him. Because of his experience and divine water environment, this process took less than a second. This is what I am talking about. Felix smiled widely as he sensed the water particles completely dominating other particles. Before he could get too excited, Chief Tesmoana offered with good intentions, Since I am already here, do you need any assistance? Is it possible to channel condensed water energy through me? Felix didn't hesitate to voice his request as he was waiting for an entire century to experience this unique and almost heavenly process. God knows how much he envied Selfie and Olivia every time he saw them going through it with Chief Clover's help. It was finally his turn. Seeing how eager and elated Felix was made Chief Tesmoana chuckle in her mind. I hope I won't disappoint your expectation. She said as she started condensing the water particles in front of Felix's own eyes. Felix would be dumb to miss on it as he had planned on finding a way to mimic it in the future. The hell is she doing? Alas, regardless of how much he tried to make sense of the process, he just couldn't figure out how it was possible to condense elemental particles. It was happening too fast and too smoothly for him to analyze it. When he tried to compare it with his abilities condensation technique, he realized that it was like comparing a horse and a seahorse. In another sense, the only thing they shared was the name. Elder Crocken, do you know how is this happening? Felix asked the water master in his camp. Not a single clue. Elder Crocken replied with a serious tone, such techniques related to elemental particles can't be learned by sight or even by another one. Don't tell me this is one of the techniques locked within the inscriptions like the conversion technique. Bingo. Upon hearing his confirmation, Felix completely dropped the notion of learning this technique. He knew that if it was related to the inscriptions, then he would need to utter the activation sentence to learn it. It was impossible to do that when the inscriptions weren't deciphered yet. This applied to all primogenitors as they had all of the manual elemental particles control locked in their bodies and they had no way to access it besides deciphering the inscriptions. Only creation primogenitors seemed to be making heads on this subject. Whoosh! Before Felix's thoughts strayed too far, Chief Tesmoana sent a visible thick blue misty aura in his chest, penetrating it instantly. The moment it emerged on the other side, Felix felt shivers coursing down his entire skin from absolute euphoria. This is the good stuff. He uttered with a blissful expression. Although the sensation was clearly not as great as the girls due to his previous experience with it, Felix still enjoyed the process immensely. I have made the process automatic. Chief Tesmoana shared, it will finish on its own after your body starts rejecting it. Am. Felix answered her with an acknowledgement noise, making her go away with a faint chuckle. After she departed, Felix started to realize that his sensation of water particles began to get somewhat clearer. This made him focus on it more instead of the euphoria. It's really increasing. Fast as hell as well. 
Felix got excited the more his senses got better as he knew that his trash elemental talents were finally being enhanced. This was a dream come true for Felix since he was always struggling to increase his manipulation range because of his crappy talents. Felix's hard work always made it seem like he was more talented than his peers, but in reality, it took him too much effort to reach the same results as them or surpass them. The fact that Felix's enemies were primogenitors didn't make it any better to feel good about his talents. But not anymore. Felix was certain that if he went through this process on a daily process for the next centuries or millennials for all of his elements, there would come a day when his elemental manipulations might not surpass primogenitors, but at least touch their ankles. At this point, that was more than he could ever wish for. After the euphoric process finished, Felix noted the time for future reference. 30 minutes, not bad. He said with a satisfied tone. It was quite a significant start compared to the girls as their bodies didn't last for two minutes. Obviously, with more exposure to this process, the duration increased and after an entire century, both of them were above an hour of exposure now. Let's see how better it is. Felix attempted to push his water manipulation range to his current limit, barely covering a hundred meters. Then, he closed his eyes and made the connection with the water particles, allowing him to sense every single one in his current range. I feel like I can go much further. Felix smiled widely as he pushed his elemental senses more than the limit. 10 meters, 20 meters, 50 meters. This is. When it was enhanced by an entire 50 meters, Felix didn't know how to react as he could feel like it was possible to push even more. 80 meters, 100 meters. The moment he went past a total of 200 meters, the water particles began to reduce in numbers at the edges, making him understand that he had reached his limitation. Yet, Felix had a mere look of excitement and a bit of anger. 100 meters increase in one sitting, is this how being gifted feels like? F asterisking hell, this is so unfair. Felix was deeply wounded within even though he was ecstatic about his results. Who could blame him? He spent decades in the ancestral dimensional pocket to push his elements to merely one kilometer each. This happened while he was receiving help from the ancestral dragon to set up the best environment for each element. At that time, he was beyond satisfied with his improvement and hard work, but only now did he understand how important being gifted helps in elemental manipulation. If you keep enhancing your water elemental talent, you will end up matching the ancient water elementalists sooner than anticipated. Elder Crocken said. Obviously, the ancient elementalists were the true gifted ones as they had the purest bloodlines to primogenitors compared to the ones in this era. So, Felix was never comparing himself with his current peers but with the old monsters. That's good enough for me. Felix smirked and restarted his training, feeling more motivated than ever. Months went by then years, before long, 500 years passed by in the Elementals galaxy. Meanwhile, merely six years in total went by on the outside, marking an uncanny difference. While nothing major had occurred in the Alliance, Felix and his party went through drastic changes as half a millennia wasn't a short period in the slightest. Starting with Olivia as she had mastered tens of omnipotent nature spells, making her surpass even high elves in terms of speed. All of this was due to Chief Clover's continuous help and the best environment for nature element. Meanwhile, Bodadai might have been whining on daily basis about his boredom and repetitive grueling training, but he still toughened through it and managed to finally master intergalactic wormhole ability in addition to many other spatial abilities. This was more than enough to help him pass his company exam and become an intergalactic delivery worm. Surprisingly, he didn't leave the Elementals galaxy even though he already fulfilled his goal. Though, he was still whining about it. As for Selfie, only one word could describe her improvement, absurd. She was already a gifted monster. Now with unlimited time, the greatest environment, and undying motivation to keep up with Felix, she did the impossible and mastered her first ever omnipotent time spell. When she used it, even Elder Stravi was left utterly shocked senseless. Unfortunately, 
Lady Yggdrasil hadn't managed to decipher more omnipotent time spells from the Runic Codex. This made self a focus on the remaining greater time spells, she planned on attempting to decipher new time spells from the Runic Codex on her own when she finished mastering the already known ones. Obviously, this wasn't a simple process as it was thousand times more difficult than mastering a spell. As for Noah, he went completely off the radar with Fenrir ever since their departure and no one knew about their progress till this point in time, Fenrir gave as little information as possible whenever he was asked. Last but not least, Felix had spent almost his entire time within the Cold Lone Island tribe doing nothing but improving his water manipulation and also mastering the remaining lesser spatial spells. Thanks to Chief Tess Moana's daily assistance, Felix's water element affinity was boosted to the point he could be considered as only below Elder Krakens. This made his life a million times easier when it came to learning water abilities, techniques, or pushing his manipulation range. Because of his firestone recovering him from his exhaustion all the time, Felix was training like he was on steroids, the initial instance of this chapter being available happened at N0v3l.bin. His hard work sure paid off as his water manipulation could be considered as officially at the top, leaving his other manipulation to eat its dust. Right now, Felix could be seen sitting in his giant form on the surface of the ocean in the middle of nowhere, wearing nothing but misty white underwear. He was holding into a gigantic gooey dark green smoothie and looking at it with a look of repulsion. I don't know if I should feel relieved or frustrated that this is the last portion of natural treasures in my possession. Felix commentated as he brought the disgusting smoothie near his mouth. Felix had prepared plenty of natural treasures and elemental minerals before his trip, knowing that he would be here for a long while. Yet still, he had already run out of elemental minerals 200 years ago and was about to run out now of natural treasures. The only good news was that his strength was nearing half a million bf, another massive milestone. Here we go. Without delay, Felix drank the disgusting mixture in one go and wiped his mouth with his sleeve while shaking his head as a horrible aftertaste hit him hard. F asterisking hell. You are about to miss this taste, just wait. Asna chuckled. As much as Felix wanted to deny it, he knew that she was right, he was completely out of his treasure stocks while he was still at the Twelve Devourers Mark and Seventh Dragon Mark. He couldn't even bring more from the outside even if he wanted as he needed permission again from Foremother Siasim. I am mostly at 470k to 480k with this last smoothie. So close to my target yet so far. Felix murmured as he tightened and opened his fists. Felix had placed a goal to replace his Kraken's bloodline with a new one after he reached half a million in his physical strength, so he could receive an insane enhancement during the process. Have you already made up your mind on your new bloodline, though? Asna inquired. Yes. Felix added, it's not like there are a lot of options to choose from. Felix was offered multiple choices years ago and the list had thinned out to merely two potential bloodlines after going through an elimination process. For example, he could not choose the wind bloodline even if he was certain that he would get the manipulation because of Rock's friendship with his masters. After all, he already had his mobility handled through lightning and space elements, whatever wind element could provide, his other elements could do it as well or even better. In addition, since this could be potentially Felix's last bloodline and also the one he would have the most connection with due to Origin Realm's breakthrough, he refused to make a rash decision and pick a bloodline that would make his life against the Darken faction much harder. This helped him remove a couple more bloodlines until he was left with merely two bloodlines. Are you sure about this? Asna asked him with a serious tone after reading his thoughts and seeing the bloodline he had picked. Boy. We know that we have placed this bloodline as an option from the start, but you should understand that getting the manipulation isn't really secured. Thor warned, that lunatic might be dead, but he is too unhinged, making it hard to guess if he will bestow you his manipulation or make your life a living hell for the fun of it. You guys told me that he can't kill me with all of you working together to keep him in line. Felix took a deep breath and said, that's enough for me. Whether he bestows me his manipulation or not, that's a risk I am willing to take. 
You are talking like you already have his bloodline in hand. Asna said with a worried tone, he is already dead so you can't make a deal with him. The only way to get his bloodline is through his secluded and powerful descendants. I know that, I am not scared one bit of them. I still have plenty of time here and by the time I come out, I will get their ancestor's bloodline either peacefully or forcefully. I am getting it either way. Felix narrowed his eyes coldly. I don't know, I still feel like the vibration element is great as well. Asna shrugged her shoulders. The power to create, shape, move, control, interact, and manipulate vibrations through the physical plane is indeed quite good. Felix nodded in agreement. It's more than that and you know it. Asna shared. It's a great powerful element that can enable you to manipulate even the tiny vibrating strings of energy that make every particle in the universe. Reaching this level of manipulation will enable you to literally deform reality as you please and even touch upon the laws. It's not considered one of the strongest elements in the universe for no reason. The vibration element was an unknown element to the public due to no records of it existing even in the old times. If it wasn't for Felix's masters telling him about the element and its primogenitor, he would have remained just as ignorant as everyone else. This element could be classified as hidden rare compared to the rest, its primogenitor was even dead, making it possible for Felix to seek out her manipulation after awakening her. Unfortunately, it wasn't as easy as it sounded. My decided element at least have descendants to get the primogenitor bloodline from. Felix shook his head, the vibration primogenitor has died before the primogenitor's era can be established, even the primogenitors have faint information about her, and you expect me to find her bloodline. Whether a primogenitor was dead or not was a different story than if it was possible to get their bloodline in the first place, without their bloodline, nothing else mattered. Felix and his masters had absolutely no clue how to find it or where to get it. You can ask the time primogenitor about it when he calls you for a meeting. Asna suggested, as the oldest primogenitor, he must know the whole story of the vibration primogenitor's early death. First, it's still doubtful if he will even meet me. Second, I am already planning to ask him for too much. Felix added before Asna could retort, last but not least, I still think the element I chose is much better for my future. Felix received the approval of his masters. It's hard to classify the primogenitors based on their strength due to their unique elements and abilities. Thor spoke with a serious tone, however if I had to classify Lord Shiva. He will be in the top three strongest and most dangerous primogenitors in the universe. He is right, nothing that exists in this universe is safe from the concept of destruction. Hormongondra added, as the destruction primogenitor, Lord Shiva was considered as the most feared and avoided primogenitor in our era. The Destruction Primogenitor's Bloodline This was Felix's decided next bloodline for the simple reason of it being one of the few bloodlines capable of transforming Felix into a true monster able to do serious damage to even the elemental lords. Before complete and utter destruction, whether it was physical, mental, energy, or concept element, nothing was safe. Felix knew that this element was going to give him the right tools to deal with his enemies compared to the vibration element or any other element. So, even though it was risky to get the bloodline and awaken the unhinged Lord Shiva, Felix was willing to go through it for the sake of his revenge. You do you, I guess. Asna dropped the subject after realizing that Felix's mind was made up. Knowing that those descendants were outside of the galaxy, Felix also dropped this subject for now and focused on the things he could do. I guess it's time to change the tribe. Felix said as he stood up on the water after reducing his size. He spent 500 years on just his water manipulation, allowing him to reach grounds he never dreamed of. However, his progress speed had been slowed immensely in the past decades after he started attempting to learn much more advanced water abilities even when Elder Kraken taught him personally. Still, with his boosted talent, he managed to learn a few advanced water abilities, he was more than satisfied with them and his overall progress. You going to the gemstone tribe? Asna asked lazily. No, I am heading to the Meyer Moore Uders tribe. 
Felix answered with a frown, I have heard news that the Scorchlanders are gaining too much territory from them. It's best to prioritize them before they end up getting completely devoured. Since Felix planned on spending at least 500 years on each tribe to further his manipulations, it was best to prioritize endangered tribes. The last thing he wanted was to travel across the world for a smaller swamp tribe, where their chief wasn't as good as Chief Drogath. Felix desired only the best of the best when it came to helping him hasten his improvement. Without further ado, Felix returned to the Cold Lone Island tribe and requested a meeting with Chief Tess Moana, he told her about his departure and thanked her for everything she had done for him. Spending 500 years with her was more than enough for Felix to bond with the Chief Tess as well as the rest of the tribe. So, he made sure to inform everyone about his departure to leave things in a good light. Just like the Emmerland Glen tribe, they held a faraway party for him, when it was over, Felix decided to teleport back to the Emmerland Glen tribe to meet with his party. Two hours later. You have just returned and already planning on leaving. Selfa spoke with a saddened tone as she sat next to Felix in his house. I have to get going, the conflict between the Scorchlanders and Meyer Mordors is getting too heated. It's my only chance to find my place there. Felix answered. Can we come too? Olivia asked, we can help you earn their friendship faster with our participation. Yes. Also, we have been spending too much time here and I think it will be good for us to practice what we have learned. Selfie agreed with her suggestion immediately. I want to go too. I will die out of boredom if I stayed here for another second. Badadai approved as well. I can't agree to it. Felix frowned, it's too dangerous. If it was up to me, I wouldn't want to join the conflict either. So, how could I agree to you following me? Felix knew that Lord Hesha's wasn't to be messed with as he could easily kill any of them with merely his spiritual pressure if they dared step into his territory. There was no way he could agree to take his friends there when they had nothing to gain out of it and everything to lose. Unfortunately, it didn't seem like they accepted his rejection. I don't care, I am going either way. Selfie was the first to revolt, knowing that Felix couldn't really stop them physically. Likewise. Olivia said with a stern tone, I want to help you but at the same time I am doing this for myself. I have spent 600 years mastering my nature runic spells and I am still feeling like I am millions of years away from origin realm. I know that's because of my lack of experience in battles to toughen my mental fortitude and will. I honestly just want to do something different. Badadai said lazily, if it means fighting, so be it. Felix was left somewhat at loss for words at his friend's rebellion as he knew that they were right. He could not stop Selfie from doing what she wanted even if he tried to get forceful, with her new mastery over time spells, she was simply untouchable. As for Olivia, Felix understood that he couldn't be always protective of her, especially, when she needed to harden her mental fortitude for the sake of reaching the origin realm. Seeing that the girls were giving him hopeful and unwavering looks made Felix understand that even if they wanted to join the conflict, they still preferred having his blessing. Sigh, fine I guess. Yay. Felix exhaled with a defeated smile after seeing them cheering with excited expressions like children being promised to be taken to Disneyland. Before their happiness could overspill, Felix switched his demeanor to a stern one and warned them, however, I want you to listen to my orders when we are there. I won't accept you acting on your own in a conflicted area. L1 T Lagoon Witnessed the first publication of this chapter on N0VELB1N. We promise you, we won't. The girls in Badadai nodded their heads swiftly in approval, still having wide grins on their faces. Pack up and go say your goodbyes we will depart in an hour. Felix informed. Without delay, they exited Felix's house and went around the village to share the news, just like Felix, their stay here had earned them many close friends within the village. Are you sure about this? Asna inquired. What choice do I have? Felix shrugged his shoulders, they are adults and can travel wherever they want. It's not up to me to force them to do anything. 
Although merely six years went by on the outside, everyone here had reached their optimal maturity as six hundred years was a long period of time. Felix had no right to treat anyone like a child and order him around. I don't care about that clingy leech, but I do worry about Olivia. Asna said, I don't think she is ready for this type of conflict. When will she ever be ready if she never took the first step? Felix smiled wryly, I might worry for her, but I applaud her decision. This is the only way for her to move forward in her path. After the girls and Badadai said their goodbyes to the villagers and the chiefs, they grouped up with Felix in the training ground. Supreme Elder, we would like to get teleport near the Meyer Marauders. Felix requested politely. The distance between the two tribes stretched beyond the horizon, Felix didn't want to travel on foot with his party as he knew that it would take way too long. Since he never visited the Meyer Marauders' territory, he couldn't open a dimensional mirror to it, the same applied to Badadai as he needed exact coordinates or visited the place once. That will cost you a food container for each member. Elder Stravi answered. Felix agreed to the payment and beamed the food containers to the side, he had to add another one since Miss Monica was going with them as well. Without further ado, Elder Stravi teleported them a couple of kilometers outside of the Meyer Marauders tribe. The moment Felix and the others opened their eyes, they realized that they were placed within a gloomy vast forest with pitch black leafless trees. The sky wasn't as sunny and welcoming anymore, it was covered completely in grey gloomy clouds, making the atmosphere unpleasant and somewhat harrowing. The tribe is in front, please, follow me. Miss Monica requested as she floated deeper into this nightmarish forest. In a short while, they encountered a huge, ominous swamp, which seemed to have absolutely no end. The scent of decay was overpoweringly unpleasant, and the earth seemed soft and mushy beneath their feet as if it would give way at any second. From the murky waters, tall cypress trees with twisted roots grew, creating unsettling shadows on the calm surface. The creepy feeling was heightened by the way that hanging moss swayed in the light air. The air was filled with a disturbing cacophony of buzzing insects and croaking frogs in addition to creepy unfamiliar noises. Be careful. Felix warned as he noticed a large green alligator with three heads moving stealthily across the water with its eyes fixed on them. I will handle it. Selfa said as she pointed her wand at the alligator. With a soft audible murmur, the alligator seemed to have been affixed in its place like it was paralyzed. But everyone knew that she had frozen it in time as the water around it was also unmoving. Gives me the creeps every time I see it. Badadai murmured to himself. It will be released after a few minutes. Selfish shared with a faint smile. Good, you take care of anyone in our way. Felix permitted, knowing that Selfa could handle such situations without leaving a mess. Before Selfa could reply, a sudden gruff voice resounded in their minds simultaneously. Leave this place while I am still asking nicely, we do not accept guests at the moment. Everyone flinched but Miss Monica and Felix as they already anticipated that the tribe's chief wouldn't allow them to walk through his territory unchecked. Miss Monica shrugged her shoulders at Felix and his party, seemingly telling them that it wasn't her problem to convince the chief to accept them. So, Felix had to take matters into his own hands. It's an honor to meet you, Chief Drogath. Felix bowed his head politely and said, I understand that you want us to leave so I won't waste your time with useless chatter. I am here to train my poison elemental manipulation and if it means buying or renting a plot of your land to make it happen, I will gladly accept any offer you make. Felix didn't mention the conflict as he wanted to see if he could get what he wanted from the chief without needing to get his hands dirty. Alas! I'm not interested in your food, leave. Tisk, as expected. Felix wasn't disheartened by his response as he knew that it had the highest chance of happening. Food was an important and desirable resource for elementals, but that's only if they had nothing else happening. In this case, how could the Meyer elementals care about food when they were literally fighting for the survival of their territory and tribe? If Felix arrived with this offer a century ago, Chief Drogath might have accepted it. But not now as their situation was too dire to care about food or anything else. 
Chief Drogath, I have heard that your tribe is being attacked by the Scorchlanders. Felix requested with a serious tone, so, if you won't accept our deal, then please give us a chance to prove our worth as we might be useful in your war. Chief Drogath suddenly appeared in front of Felix and his party in the shape of a dark green muddy monster with illuminating eyes. Child, you are talking about things you don't understand at all. He said expressionlessly. All I know is that your tribe is an uninterrupted path towards its damnation and no one is offering you any assistance. Felix replied with a serious tone, I am offering my services for nothing but a place to train and hopefully some assistance from you. I also want to offer my services. Selfie added. Likewise. Me too. The rest of the team backed Felix when he needed it, knowing that it would be difficult to refuse free help in a losing war from many individuals. You little ones think that you have what it takes to help my tribe. Chief Drogath scoffed. Felix knew that Chief Drogath had absolutely no knowledge about them as he didn't bother to even send someone to trade food when everyone else was doing it. So, it was normal to be underestimated by him. How about a test? Felix proposed, we will fight your tribesmen and if we win, you have to take us in. If we loss, we won't bother you again. Chief Drogath went silent at Felix's proposal, seeming like he was thinking about the upsides and the downsides of it. Fine. When he realized that he had nothing to lose and everything to gain, Chief Drogath could only agree to the proposal. Follow me. He said calmly as he led the relieved Felix and his party toward the center of the swamp. After they arrived, they were met with a collection of huts built on stilts, with wooden walkways and bridges connecting them. The huts were made of wood and thatched roofs, with a few small windows and a single door. The walkways were slippery and uneven, making travel difficult for anyone unfamiliar with the terrain. Unlike the Emmerland Glen, there were barely twenty elementals in the village and even then, they seemed wary and unwelcoming with the arrival of Felix's party. The atmosphere was similar to the Deathly Forest as it was silent and creepy as hell, making the girls a bit uncomfortable being near those disgustingly looking elementals. He just had to have poison as an element. Olivia thought to herself as she raised her guards to the limit in this unfriendly atmosphere. Eldred, Willow, Sira, any one of you, get over here. Chief Drogath called calmly. Abruptly, a living, breathing extension of the bog itself emerged from one of the huts. Its body was a writhing mass of vines, roots and mud, coiling and twisting in a never-ending dance of life and decay. Its form was constantly shifting and evolving, taking on new shapes and textures as it moved toward Felix and his friends. The creature's tendrils reached out in all directions, snaking through the water and wrapping around the trees and underbrush of the swamp. This sight alone was enough to freak out Badadai and Olivia as the monster was even scarier than Chief Drogath. You should be wary of him. Asna warned with a deep frown, his consciousness prowess is extraordinary. Before Felix could reply, Chief Drogath introduced the elemental, This is Eldred, one of my many commanders in this war, he is the consciousness of the southern poisonous swamp. Since most of my tribesmen are at the front lines, he will be testing you. M. Just like a lazy stupid walking monster, Eldred acknowledged his chief's introduction with an eerie noise. Sh asterisk T, if this thing fought Olivia or even Badadai, he will definitely crush them with merely his consciousness prowess. Felix frowned, knowing the situation was going as planned. He thought Chief Drogath would pair them with someone near their strength but he completely forgot that their strength wasn't unknown to the chief in the first place. So, he literally picked the first choice to have accepted his call, not caring about the strength difference. If Felix dared to make excuses about this situation, he might end up getting kicked out immediately. After all, what's the point of having them join the war if all they could do was take care of the pawns? I guess there is only one way to pass this test. Any problem? Chief Drogath asked after seeing Felix's party's deadly silence. Not at all. Felix narrowed his eyes at Eldred and said, I am going first. M. Eldred agreed with the same eerie noise. 
Eldred didn't seem to care about which opponent he would face, this spoke volumes about his strength as he couldn't be assigned to be a commander without having the strength to back it up. Chief Drogath took everyone away from the village and stopped at a somewhat empty area within the deathly gloomy forest. You will keep fighting until I stop it. Chief Drogath said calmly, that's the only rule, understood. Yes. MMMM. Felix was somewhat relieved to hear this as it meant that Chief Drogath wasn't planning on having anyone die on him, this was good news for Olivia and Bodadai. As for herself, eh? Felix trusted in her capabilities to pass the test. Won't Eldred be much weaker when he isn't fighting in his territory? Bodadai inquired as he watched Felix and Eldred take their positions by standing away from each other. It can be said that he will lose at least 30% of his consciousness prowess. Selfie answered, if it wasn't for him being still in a positive environment to his elements, he would have lost at least 90%. Dot. Felix would have been in big trouble if they decided to take the fight to the southern poisonous swamp. Olivia supported her take as she had learned many things about elementals in the past centuries, unlike Fatty Bodadai. He is still not out of the water. Selfie murmured, we have no clue about his consciousness prow. Hoosh. Before she could finish her sentence, Eldred released an intense amount of pressure that was thick enough it manifested as a wavy transparent aura around him. Dear Lord! L1 Telagoon witnessed the first publication of this chapter on N0 Velbion. This was spiritual pressure that was born out of consciousness prowess. For it to be this thick and intense, the girls knew that they would be forced into passing out the moment they were hit by it. Whoosh! Because of the foggy forest, the moment Eldred aimed his spiritual pressure on Felix, the thick aura pushed the fog away as it rushed in the direction of Felix rapidly, resembling an army of ghosts charging at once. Elementals are truly monsters. Felix smiled wryly as he released his own spiritual pressure to the limit. He also managed to manifest his own aura to the shock of the bystanders, but it was obvious that it wasn't as intense as Eldred's. Boom. Still, when those two auras crashed with each other, Felix was merely propelled a few meters away before regaining his balance. MMMM. Eldred released the same eerie voice but it was an octave higher, a clear sign of surprise. Not bad. Chief Drogath also had the same reaction as he anticipated this battle to end through spiritual pressure overpowering. In his eyes, Felix was a mere human mortal at the core and it was a known fact that their spiritual pressure was dog sh asterisk t. Are you ready to fight for real now? Felix asked calmly as he took his fighting posture, knowing that Eldred would not use his spiritual pressure again. It was useless if it wasn't able to completely overwhelm the opponent since it had bad aftermath of overusing it. MMMM. Seemingly like he had earned Eldred's respect. He swiftly recalled his spiritual pressure and nodded at him in acknowledgement. Whoosh! Before Felix could react, Eldred's monstrous muddy body released an uncanny amount of fog around him, causing him to disappear out of sight instantly. Felix started switching between visions to spot him but he failed each time, making him shield himself with a condensed crystallized adamant and thin body armor. As a swamp elemental, he is capable of manipulating fog, water, plant, earth, wind, and poison. Felix thought to himself as he scanned the increasingly thicker fog in the area. Phew. 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 Just as he attempted to predict Eldred's attacking plan, he was forced to jump into the air after countless purplish vines and thick tree roots emerged from underneath him. Like homing missiles, they followed after Felix even in the air. Phew. 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 Before Felix could attempt to evade them, he realized that the wind around him became insanely resistant to his movement, making him feel like a fish trying to swim upstream. Wind lockage. Selfie exclaimed instantly after seeing Felix's slowed down movement in the air. Olivia and Bodadai weren't given even a second to react before their eyes widened in shock at the sight of a humongous wooden hammer being manifested high above Felix's head and outside of the fog. To make matters even worse, the entire area seemed to be filling up with thick bubbling acidic green water that was coming out of nowhere. 
Felix might be unable to spot Eldred but he wasn't blind enough to not see the building up poisonous swamp and the hammer above him. Slice slice slice. So, he transformed his armored arms into sharp blades and began cutting off the incoming vines and roots even though his mobility was limited immensely. Can I teleport away? Felix sought to change his location through his teleportation, but after noticing the environment he was in, he knew that his spell hex wouldn't manifest properly. Even if it did, it would get destroyed by the raging wind. Spellcasters were extremely strong but that's only if their runic hexes could be manifested and sustained throughout the spell activation. Otherwise, they were nothing but sitting ducks. Safety cube. Still, Felix knew exactly how to get himself out of trouble without doing too much as he manifested a crystallized white cube and locked himself inside of it. Thud. The cube resisted the raging wind easily and landed on the acidic swamp without getting affected in the slightest by it. When Eldred saw this, he didn't hesitate to use the humongous wooden hammer on the cube. Boom. Shatter. The collision resulted in a powerful shockwave that cleaned out almost the entire area from the fog, allowing the bystanders to see clearly that the cube was merely pushed a bit deeper into the ground while the wooden hammer had shattered instantly into fragments. Eldred manifested from the mud again and eyed the crystallized cube with an irritated look, seeming like he understood that his current set of abilities wasn't going to break through it. You, will, hide, forever. For the first time ever since he appeared, he finally spoke out loud in a choppy way like he wasn't used to talking at all. You started it by hiding your physical form. Felix replied causally from inside the cube. How am I supposed to fight you like that without resulting in destroying the entire forest? By now, Felix realized that Eldred had transmuted himself into either the poisonous swamp, the wind, the fog, or almost anything in this environment. This meant that touching him was out of the window without drastic measures that might result in mass destruction. Destroying, the forest? Ha, ha, give, it, a, try. It seemed like Eldred believed that Felix was bluffing as he taunted him to go for it. Chief, I advise you to fix this. Miss Monica warned with a serious tone, that boy isn't messing around. He is capable of deleting your entire territory with his abilities. Interesting. Chief Drogath believed Miss Monica, making him realize that he might have underestimated Felix a little bit. Still. This didn't mean that he was scared of his destructive powers as he knew that Elder Stravi forbade such things in his celestial body. In other words, Felix would be getting in trouble and his territory wouldn't be too affected. Eldred, use your physical form, this is just a test. Chief Drogath ordered. He might not fear Felix's destructive force, but it didn't mean that he would force him to use it in a mere test. MMMM. Doing as he was told. Eldred refrained from taunting Felix anymore and decided to keep his physical form up. When Felix noticed this, he smirked faintly and said to himself, I didn't think I will be testing my retribution coffin technique so soon. SZLZLZLZLZLZLZLZ. Abruptly, the crystallized cube was turned into an illuminating green lightning show as Felix released trillions of green electrical bolts inside. Before Eldred and the others could react to this weird move by Felix, he snapped his finger casually as he uttered, Spatial Displacement. With one sudden flash of light, everyone was left flabbergasted by the sight of Felix appearing in the same place as Eldred. <laughs> a split second later, a sharp painful scream made them change their focus from Felix to within the bright cube, when they saw Eldred's muddy body getting burnt solid before turning into dust they couldn't help but draw a deep cold breath in dread. Only Chief Drogath seemed to be a bit surprised and at the same time pleased. That's enough. Chief Drogath waved his hand, causing the crystallized cube to get forcefully shattered into fragments with nothing but his own spiritual pressure. SZZLZLZLZLZ. The green electrical bolts escaped everywhere like snakes being released into the wild, leaving Eldred finally at peace. Is it my win? Felix asked with a faint smile as he eyed Eldred, who had been turned into a pile of brown dust, releasing smoke like he had just gotten out of an oven. 
You passed the test. Chief Drogath replied calmly. Is there another elemental to test my friends? Felix coughed, I doubt Sir Eldred is capable of continuing the fight with his soul damaged like this. Felix aimed for this result one way or another as he knew that his soul-burning attribute was going to leave Eldred traumatized to fight his friends. Since elementals felt pain in their soul alone, this attribute was literally their worst enemy. Because soul pain was so rare, most elementals lived their lives without feeling pain even once, this explained Eldred's over-the-top reaction to the pain. No need for further testing. Chief Drogath ended up shocking them with a different verdict, all of you have been approved. Hmm. Did something change or caught his eye? Felix wondered in his mind. You, follow me. The rest, pick an empty house in the village and stay in it for now. Chief Drogath said as he pointed his finger at Felix. Without asking too many questions, Felix followed Chief Drogath, who was heading in the opposite direction of the village. After following him for a few hours, Felix realized their destination. We are heading to the front lines. He knitted his eyebrows at the sight of the volcanic smog filling up the night sky above the horizon. Soon, Chief Drogath and Felix had stopped on top of a giant black ashy boulder that was overseeing almost everything around it. Boom! Boom! Thud! Felix's eyes were drawn to an ongoing battle between a small army of the Meyer Marauders and the Scorchlanders at the far distance. The never-ending symphony of explosions was enough to let anyone imagine the brutality of the fight as both armies were using everything in their powers to take down their enemies. While Scorchlanders mainly were a bunch of molten hard golems or lava creatures, the Meyer Marauders were monstrous fiends made out of thick swamp water, wood, or mud. Both sides seemed to be trading fire from a distance like they weren't daring to clash against each other physically. The Territory Line Felix figured out instantly that it was because of their inability to cross territories without losing most of their strength. On one side, there was a sea of flowing lava and molten magma and on the other side, there was a raging bubbling swamp. It looks like the flowing lava is winning the territorial ground. Asna said after spotting that the flowing lava was eating through the swamp in a slow manner. No wonder the Scorchlanders are conquering territories without an equal. Felix frowned, knowing that the war would end up in Scorchlanders' favor if they kept pushing their territory gains like this. This is what we have been dealing with for the past millennia. Chief Drogath stated expressionlessly, a slow cruel death. Elementals might be revived by someone higher than them in the hierarchy, but that was only possible if they had their territories left to be revived in. Since Elder Stravi didn't get himself involved in such conflicts, it meant that there was no one to stop Lord Hesha's domination. Will Supreme Elder or King Valdhurs really do nothing and watch as Lord Hesha's terraform the entire continent into a living burning hell? Felix asked. Felix knew that Elder Stravi refused to get himself involved in such conflicts, but he felt weirded out by the fact that Lord Hesha's was allowed to go this far. The origin of this chapter's debut can be traced to N0V3LB1N. Who knows? Chief Drogath replied calmly. King Valdhir might just decide on a whim to push back Lord Hesha's expansion to his original territory and revive everyone, at the same time, he may not care at all. As for Elder Stravi? As long as no mass destruction occurred on his celestial body, he is fine with anything that happens. I see. Felix didn't know what to say, this entire conflict seemed bizarre and surreal to him. From where he came from, such wars happen only when other solutions didn't work or one party's hatred ran too deep to care about other solutions. In this case, Chief Drogath didn't seem to hate Scorchlanders or Lord Hesha's in his conquering plan. In fact, he looked too unfazed by the thought of death like he knew that his life wouldn't end even if he lost the war. As for Lord Hesha's, Felix found him more peculiar. In his eyes, he would never start a conquering quest without first making sure that King Valdhir wouldn't interfere in later stages. What's the point of spending thousands of years of effort to conquer the entire continent just to have everything reset back to zero and everyone revived? Maybe he is doing it for entertainment. Candace wondered. Who knows? 
Felix was told that the main purpose of those conflicts was expanding territory to enable the biggest tribe to get more food since they would have more areas for elemental mines to be born. So, if Lord Hesha's only wanted this, he wouldn't go for continental domination to avoid having everything reset. At this point, it was too soon to figure out the true motives of Lord Hesha's, making Felix put this subject to rest for now. I brought you here to understand that no one cares about the thought of death. Chief Drogath said as he eyed Felix, as long as I am alive, my people will be alive. In your case, I won't be able to save you. So, are you still desiring to join the conflict? Cough, is it possible to receive your help without? Not a chance. I am born for wars. Felix switched instantly to a serious tone making Asna roll her eyes at his shamelessness. Good, now tell me more about your ability to harm souls. Chief Drogath asked with a hint of curiosity. Looks like this is what caught his eyes. Felix smirked in his mind before answering, it's a unique attribute that I can add to my elemental abilities, it can burn souls until they break apart. Interesting. Chief Drogath rubbed his chin thoughtfully, if we took advantage of this to put the Scorchlanders into an agonizing pain, they will be forced to retreat and buy us some time to regain our lost territories. Without an ounce of hesitation, he turned to Felix and requested for him to do that. Obviously, he didn't order him but give him an irrefusable incentive to do it on his own. If you force them to retreat, I will help you with your training or whatever. Say less. Felix cracked his knuckles and walked slowly to the edge of the giant volcanic boulder. He zoomed on the territorial line and then teleported into the middle of the air above it. Boom! Boom! Crash! Now that he was in the middle of the chaotic war, the noise was almost unbearable. This was nothing compared to the chaotic unruliness of those two opposing forces as giant fiery meteors kept being launched at the Mire Marauders just to be blocked by hydrojets of poisonous streams. Some flying lava elementals were releasing a rain of fire from the sky just to be blocked by thick wooden shields, setting them on fire instantly and turning them into coal. Because lava and water were opposite forces, the entire battleground was covered with fog which helped the Meyer Marauders a little due to being able to manipulate it to their advantage. Still, it was clear to Felix that regardless of what they did, they were merely prolonging the inevitable as the lava sea was unstoppable. The territorial line stretched to thousands of kilometers if not more. I guess it's time to test my new limits. Felix smiled faintly as he sat on top of a burning wooden shield, completely hidden from elementals. Honestly. Even if he was visible, no one would pay him attention during this chaotic battle. Felix closed his eyes and sent a directed telepathic message to Chief Drogath, requesting that he make his armies give up on their swamp control, so he could be the sole controller, in addition, to stay as far as possible from it. Albeit the request was a bit tough to swallow, Chief Drogath responded with actions. Our guest will take control over the swamp, don't resist it and get out of it. He ordered. Guest. But chief. What are you talking about? Obviously, his order was met with some resistance from the appointed commanders of his armies. Who could blame them? They were requested to give up on their sole method of defense against the raging assault of the Scorchlanders to a guest they never heard about. Just do it. With a firmer tone from Chief Drogath, no one dared to oppose his order again. You are free to act. Thanks. Felix kept his eyes closed shut and released his water manipulation senses to the limit, causing a sea of water particles to appear in his mind. A sea stretching for thousands of kilometers and he was capable of controlling each water particle in it. This was Felix's new water manipulation range after going through 500 years of training and talent boosting, marking an insane jump from merely 100 meters to this godly unbelievable radius. Let's start with this. Felix opened his eyes and looked at the thousands of scorch landers across the entire battleground. Then, he uttered under his breath, the great flood. Rumble rumble. The swamp began withdrawing away from the territorial line, causing the Meyer marauders to forcefully retreat with it and the lava sea to speed up its annihilation. 
What are they doing? Zaitos frowned at this peculiar sight. As the right hand of Lord Hishas, he was trusted with leadership over conquering the Meyer Marauders tribe. Mother Fasterisker, we have lost ten meters of our territory in a few seconds. That's more than what we lost in an entire month. Chief. Please give us the order to control our swamp. This is bad, this is so bad. While he was a bit confused, no one in the Meyer Marauders had a positive reaction to the swamp's withdrawal as they rained curses on Felix and requests on their chief. Unfortunately, Chief Drogath backed Felix even when he was losing the land on his territory at an unprecedented speed. Whoosh! Hey! Suddenly, the swamp began to raise higher and higher while still withdrawing away from the territorial line, what stunned the elementals the most was the size of their swamp getting bigger like an insane amount of water was being pumped into it. When they used their senses, they noticed Felix floating within the swamp with his body size reaching tens of kilometers and still growing bigger. He was releasing an uncanny amount of green water from his body, which resulted in the swamp's quantity being increased noticeably. Since the swamp was already green in color, no one realized that the soul-burning attribute was being added to it. Am I tripping or is that Sir Felix? Zytos was startled after spotting Felix's face through the water as he never thought he would be seeing him in this place ever. Commander, what do we do? Commander, orders. Do we use the same countermeasure plan? The origin of this chapter's debut can be traced to N0V3LB1N. Before he could think too deeply about this, his army began requesting orders to deal with this new situation. The sight of the swamp reaching tens of kilometers in height across thousands of kilometers was a frightening scene to anyone, but not to them. Just take cover and let our lava sea handle it like usual. Zytos ordered. Just like they were used to dealing with large tsunamis, the ground elementals got rid of their physical form and merged with the lava sea while the flying elementals just flew higher than the rising tsunami. None of them seemed scared or worried about this tsunami since the Meyer marauders had used this strategy long ago and it failed miserably. Felix wasn't the only one smart enough to attempt to attack the Scorchlanders with one humongous and destructive tsunami. Unfortunately, when the Meyer marauders attempted this, it resulted in their swamp completely evaporating into the fog while the lava sea merely cooling off into hardened magma stones. Although Meyer marauders could control the fog, it was useless when dealing with lava or magma, this implied that this strategy literally hastened their territory getting seized. Before the Meyer marauders could assault Felix with all types of curses, he jumped outside of the rising tsunami that was frozen in its place like it was placed against an invisible wall. Then, he reduced his size to merely 10 meters and stood at the edge of the tsunami with his hands behind his back, making him noticeable to those at the front. The hell, it's really him. Zytos eyes widened in disbelief after he got his confirmation. Scorchlanders, because of my good relationship with your lord, I will be polite enough to give you a chance to retreat on your own. With a solemn tone, Felix released a public telepathic message for everyone to hear. What the hell is this outsider talking about? A chance to retreat? Is he for real? So, this is the fable food merchant? What a joke! Obviously, Felix's statement was met with unified scorn from both parties, they might be at war with each other, but they would still side with each other against an outsider if he acted like this. Sir Felix, what's going on? Why are you taking part in this? Zytos asked Felix telepathically with clear confusion. My apologies Sir Zytos, but this is something I have to do in order to achieve my goals. Felix requested with a bitter smile, so, please listen to my warning and retreat your armies. Sir Felix, I have no idea why you joined this conflict and I won't pry. Zytos said with a cold tone, but, we are never going to retreat either for you or even if your masters requested us personally. We listen to only our Lord's orders. Felix's expression returned to being stern again and said one last time, I respect that, so, don't come back and tell me I haven't warned you. Before Zytos could process Felix's last statement, the Great Flood was unleashed on his armies, 
causing the ground and mountains to shake on its awake. Rumble rumble! Take cover! The Scorchlanders were nowhere to be seen as they had already merged their consciousness with the lava sea, having complete trust that nothing would happen to it but cool down. As volcanic elementals, returning lava from its stoned form to its flowing form was nothing to brag about. Sadly for them, they never dealt with a flood controlled by Felix. T-S-S-H-S-H-S-H-S-H-S-H-S-H-S-H The moment the Great Flood collided with the Lava Sea, the Meyer Marauders showed a despaired expression at the sight of their hard-created swamp being turned into a thick useless green fog. Unbeknownst to them, the Scorchlanders were going through a completely different experience. a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a IT Burns F asterisk CKK My soul IT Burns Make IT stop Please Screams, pleading, weeping, shouts, and curses were sung in utter silence on the outside, but every scorch lander on the battlefield was hearing them. Hey, hey. Zytos and the rest of the flying Scorch Landers were left utterly petrified by the symphony of their people's cries for help like they were being tortured by a madman. They had no clue what the F asterisk CK was going on and it looked like no one was in his right mind to explain it to them. It seemed like the flying Scorch Landers were about to find out as the green fog had begun to ascend to the sky. The shocked flying Scorch Landers had no reason to avoid or fear it, making them get covered by it. Ouch. What the F asterisk CK? My soul. Just like their brothers and sisters, the attributed fog started burning their souls for each second they stayed in it. Luckily for them, it wasn't as potent as in the water and they still had great mobility, helping them outrun the fog expansion like their lives depended on it. Zytos was one of them, making him understand with great dread and fear what his armies were currently going through. Retreat. 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 He shouted at everyone, knowing that even if the water was completely evaporated, they would need to deal with the fog, which would be covering a much larger surface area. This would make it near impossible to get out of it without having their souls completely toasted. Just like they received a royal pardon, the Scorch Landers morphed into their fastest forms and escaped from the hellish water. A a a a a a a a a a a a a since there was still plenty of thick fog, the only thing they could do was scream their pain away as they flew towards their territory at top of their speed. Obviously, not everyone managed to ignore the soul pain and escape, some Scorch Landers completely gave in to this new experience of agonizing torture until their souls couldn't handle it and got destroyed in the end. What did I just witness? What? Why? How? Are they really retreating? Why are they screaming their lungs out? The Meyer marauders were left shocked speechless by the sight of their mortal enemies running away for the first time ever since the war started. The fact that the Scorch Landers had escaped with their tails between their legs while screaming in pain made them confused, but at the same time understand that this wasn't a ploy by the outsider. Not bad, not bad at all. Chief Drogath commentated while cracking a pleased smile as he watched the Scorch Landers galloping to the horizons while completely giving up on the territorial line. Whoosh! What's next? Felix asked indifferently as he teleported next to Chief Drogath, standing in his previous place like he never left it. With their souls wounded like this, it won't be polite of us to not regain at least 20% of our lost territory. Chief Drogath smiled at Felix and asked, How about you lead this mission? Why not? Felix smirked. In less than an hour, Felix went from being tested to joining the conflict to become one of its leaders, only Felix could pull off such an insane jump. Without delay, Felix led the Meyer marauders to reclaim their lost territories, because of the horrific method he used on their enemies. The Meyer marauders didn't dare to oppose his orders or complain about him anymore. Honestly, Felix didn't do much but give out the order and watch them terraform the hardened lava sea into a swampy damp environment. Without the Scorch Landers to interrupt them, the reclamation process carried on smoothly for the next 10 kilometers. In less than a few minutes, a desolate foggy, 
and murky jungle was born on the battlefield like it was here for centuries. Meanwhile, Zytos and his armies were left to watch decades of their effort go to waste in the blink of an eye with indignant looks. Still, none of them dared to get near the green swamp as just the mere sight of it made their souls shiver. L1 T Lagoon witnessed the first publication of this chapter on N0 Velbion. What do we do? Everyone turned to Zytos, hoping for a solution to save the rest of the conquered territory. Unfortunately, Zytos was as hopeless as them. He had absolutely no clue how to deal with the soul-burning attribute as it was the first time he experienced such a thing. Knowing that he couldn't risk making a random decision, Zytos decided to update his father on the situation. SH asterisk T, I am going to get the scolding of a lifetime. Zytos eyed Felix with an irked look, clearly extremely displeased with his involvement and the trouble he created for him. Work together to create a magma wall to stop their advances. Zytos ordered, if they seem to be preparing another tsunami, ditch the wall and distance yourselves. He didn't even need to tell them the second part as every one of them was already traumatized out of their minds by the swamp. While the Scorch Laters were preparing to slow down the Meyer Marauder's advancement, Zytos went to a private place and connected with his father. He told him everything that happened and obviously brought out Felix's involvement to shift the blame, Lord Hesius wasn't pleased one bit when he heard about the entire situation. Why did he shove his nose in this? Lord Hesius asked coldly. He told me that he is forced to do this for his goals or some crap. Zytos answered, he didn't really clarify. Is he still there? Yes, he is currently leading the Meyer tribesmen. Good. Without warning, Lord Hesius took control over Zytos' consciousness and physical form. Then, he took off towards the front lines and stood on top of the rising magma wall. When Felix spotted him and zoomed on Zytos' expression, he immediately recognized it to belong to Lord Hesius. He appeared faster than anticipated. Brat, it looks like spending a long time with us made you believe yourself to be one of us. Lord Hesius addressed Felix coldly from a distance. I am still a guest my lord and I never dared think otherwise. Felix replied politely while making sure that he stayed on his side of the territorial line. Your actions disapprove of your words. Lord Hesius narrowed his eyes coldly, but, I am not here to bicker with you. I will warn you only once. Return to the northern forest and spend what remained of your vacation there in peace. Otherwise, you won't be able to return even if you involved your masters. This threat was more than enough to intimidate anyone as Lord Hesius wasn't known to be kind or patient, in other words, if Felix dared to ignore his warning, he would have only himself to blame when Lord Hesius make an example out of him. My apologies, but that, I cannot do. Felix shook his head, I came here to fulfill some harsh goals and the only way to achieve them is to take advantage of every opportunity before me. Unfortunately for our relationship, my goals conflicted with it, leaving me no choice but to terminate it and go against your tribe. It's not personal, it's just business. Felix stated with a composed tone as he eyed Lord Hesha's directly, feeling not an ounce of fear or intimidation. Not personal? Just business? Child, do you think I give a damn about your feelings or motives? I have warned you and you chose to ignore it. That's all I need to know. It was clear to all that Lord Hesha's was done chatting and that there was nothing to remedy the situation for Felix anymore. Lord, before you leave, I do believe you still owe me a favor. Felix stated out loud for everyone to hear. A favor. Chief Drogath raised an eyebrow in surprise as he never heard about this, the same applied to most tribesmen in the battleground. Don't tell me he is planning to use the favor for our benefit. If he did, I will never talk crap to him again. It can't be, no one is that generous. While the Meyer marauders were discussing this, Lord Hesha's merely turned his head slowly and uttered with a chilling tone that sent goosebumps through the souls of both armies. Child. I really advise you to choose your next words carefully. This time, Lord Hesha straightway threatened Felix, making everyone understand that he wasn't messing about. 
I am merely hoping to get a 500 years truce between the two tribes. Felix stated, I don't think I am asking for too much. Felix's request made the Meyer marauders feel instant appreciation and closeness to him, half a millennia of peace were truly desired by every one of them as they had been non-stop fighting, dying, and reviving for a very long time. Alas! I am a man of my word, but you can absolutely forget asking me for even one year of truce. Favor or not, it's not happening. Lord Hesha's rejected it mercilessly, making the Meyer marauders have their hopes crushed at getting some peace against this tyrant. I see. Felix sighed in disappointment on the outside, but in his heart? He was smiling wickedly like his rejection was a calculated move. Since our relationship has already fallen through, I think it's best to use this favor right now to get anything. Felix looked at Lord Hesha's with a serious expression and requested, Will you give me your word then to never kill me during this W? No. Another request was shot down before Felix could finish his sentence. Then, how about you at least give your word to never use your consciousness prowess on me or my party? Felix said with a firm tone, if you rejected this too, then you might as well retract your favor as I don't need anything else. Lord Hesha's realized that he was put in a somewhat sticky situation as he didn't want to give Felix what he asked for. After all, his consciousness prowess would enable him to kill Felix the instant he stepped on his territory. He wasn't feeling like this because he thought that he couldn't kill Felix without it, he just felt that it would be too much of a hassle to use other methods. Unfortunately, too many eyes were on him at the moment and he had already rejected two requests from Felix. Hesha's, don't tell me this little one is scaring you. Abruptly, King Valdher's voice boomed from the sky as his featureless face shaped up on the gloomy black clouds. I don't blame him really, this kid is clearly special and without his spiritual pressure, he will most likely suffer to handle him. Elder Stravi face appeared to King Valdher as his sarcastic voice echoed in everyone's ears. Before those two gods, no one dared to speak up or even raise their heads and look at their featureless faces, however, Lord Hesha's, Chief Drogath, and Felix were a special case. Looks like those two old fogies really want to see some new drama happening to get themselves involved. Asna giggled, knowing a pot stirrer from a mere glance. As long as they are on my side, I don't care what they do. Felix smirked faintly at the sight of Lord Hesha's face turning bad at their statements. From the get-go, Felix wanted this request to be chosen instead of the other two since it would allow him to truly join the conflicts without fearing having his soul blown out of nowhere by Lord Hesha's. The truce request was merely useful for the short term and also for no one but the Meyer marauders. He still needed to earn the favor of the desert tribe. As for the not the dying request? He knew that Lord Hesha's was never going to agree to it after showing him his soul-burning ability. This meant the best use of the favor was to negate the greatest threat to him, which was the consciousness prowess massive difference. I hope those two old geezer's words don't make you get too cocky of yourself. Lord Hesha's addressed Felix with his usual indifferent tone, unlike me, they don't care if you die or live. How rude! What a nasty allegation! Lord Hesha's ignored their replies and continued on as he kept staring Felix in the eyes, clearly, you also don't care about your life. So, I promise you to never use my consciousness prowess on you. Before Felix could be overjoyed by his agreement, Lord Hesha smiled wickedly as he used his powers to create a decorated hellish bridge connecting the magma wall and the swamp. You are welcome to enter my territory any time you want. Cough, maybe in the future. Felix replied as he gulped a mouthful in dread at the way Lord Hesha was looking at him. He knew that even without the consciousness prowess, Lord Hesha's strength in his territory was merely a bit weaker than a primogenitor due to his overpowered multiple elemental manipulations. Felix would be a retard to enter his territory now that he had pissed him off. I will be waiting. With that last ominous and creepy statement, Lord Hesha's finally gave Zytos his body back. You done messed up big time now. Zytos said as he gave Felix a sympathetic look knowing that Felix had really riled up his father. After Lord Hesha's left, 
Felix found no reason to keep leading the army to reclaim the lost territories at this moment, knowing that it would take a long while before the Scorchlanders could restart their offense. Chief Drogath knew this as well and took Felix back to the village, leaving his commanders to continue pushing forward. What happened? Selfie asked with a worried tone after Felix regrouped with them inside one of the huts at the edges of the village. Well, I have officially declared war on the Scorchlanders and Lord Hesha's. Felix coughed, it's best that you don't cross the territorial line for now. Felix knew that he would be on Lord Hesha's radar for a while which meant the moment he stepped inside his territory, he would be waiting for him to capture him or his friends. You must have done something bad again. Olivia rolled her eyes at him, knowing that Felix wouldn't be at ease without creating trouble. Bad or good, who cares? Badadai asked with an eager tone, when are we going to join the fights? I am itching to vent my bordu, cough, to help the poor swamp people. Badadai might be still a shameless worm, but he had indeed gotten much stronger in the past 600 years. Soon, for now, sit tight and don't make trouble for the villagers. Felix said as he stood up, I am going to get my payment. Without delay, Felix went to Chief Drogath who was waiting for him at the village hall. He jumped straight to the point and requested, I am planning to begin my training right now, I hope you can assist me. Chief Drogath sized Felix up and down in silence instead of answering him. Felix remained patiently waiting for him, trusting that he wouldn't go back on his word due to his demonstrated importance in this war. After a few moments of this deathly silence, Chief Drogath asked, So, you want to train your poison manipulation? Yes. Anything else? From this environment? I only require to train my poison manipulation. I see. Chief Drogath inquired, how do you want me to help you? Felix explained to him the process of channeling purified condensed poison energy through him. As expected, Chief Drogath didn't seem to mind it too much even when he heard that Felix would be needing this process on daily basis. A smile broke on Felix's face after finally receiving a confirmation, although he had made himself a powerful enemy in the process. Felix still felt that it was more than worth it. He just couldn't imagine himself working on his elemental manipulations anymore without enhancing his shitty talents first. It was like he was asleep before and he was finally awakened to witness the world's magnificent beauty, there was no way he would allow himself to go back to his sleep. Can we start now? Sure. While Felix was taken to the most poisonous swamp in the tribe's territory to begin his training, Lord Hesha's was holding an emergency meeting with his tribal heads. The outsider isn't to be underestimated. Lord Hesha's said coldly, he is capable of attacking the souls through his elemental abilities somehow. Just the sound of it made the tribal heads nervous and a bit spooked. Due to their immortality, none of them worried too much about what happened to them during their fights as they could always get revived. But now? They realized that if they fought Felix, he was going to make them beg for their death by torturing their souls, this chapter was originally shared via n 0 slash vel slash bion Should we send reinforcement? E. Avroim suggested, now, that we know about his soul-burning ability, we can create a counter-method against it. In the process, it is best to send reinforcement to avoid giving up too much of our conquered territory. This sounds good and all but the only way to send reinforcement is if we reduced our armies from other front lines. One of the tribal heads retorted, this will definitely alarm the other tribes and make them take advantage of the situation and go all out on us. He is right. Our forces are already stretched too thin. The other tribal heads agreed with him one by one, knowing that their tribe's situation was quite special. While other tribes engage in 1 vs 1, Lord Hesha's ordered his tribe to attack all the bordering tribes simultaneously. Since they were situated at the center of the continent, this implied that they were sharing borders with multiple tribes. They are bound to find out about this sooner or later as Chief Drogath isn't an idiot to not take advantage of his favorable position. Not sending reinforcement as soon as possible will only lead us to lose more territory. All of you know how difficult for us to win over even one meter of territory. 
E. Avroim doubled down on her suggestion with a serious tone. She is right. Lord Hesha's supported her before the others could open their mouths. Send as much reinforcement as needed to completely overwhelm the Meyer Marauders and their new toy. Lord Hesha's ordered coldly, I don't care if it meant losing territories from other tribes. We can always retake them in the future. Although this plan seemed risky and had a big chance of getting them screwed over by the other tribes, everyone knew that it was the best solution to handle this variable. In their eyes, if they went all out on the Meyer Marauders, having Felix on their side would mean Jack Share asterisk T. After all, hundreds of thousands of elementals working together against merely a thousand elementals and a human was pure bullying. What are you still doing here? Lord Hesha's eyed them coldly, move it. Whoosh whoosh. The tribal heads exited the chamber room swiftly and went to take care of his order, leaving only E. Avroim behind. Father, I know I was the one suggesting sending reinforcement, but what if the other tribes decided to create an alliance again and attack us from all fronts simultaneously while we are at our weakest? E. Avroim thought with a worried look. The last time my enemies tried allying against me, they failed horribly. Lord Hesha sneered, history will repeat itself if they dared take this road. E. Avroim couldn't help but recall the first conquered tribes and what happened to their chiefs when they decided to ally with each other and assault her father's territory. All of them got absolutely owned by her father, this while his territory wasn't even half the size of their current territory, which meant his strength was much weaker. I apologize for worrying too much. Days went by and then weeks, Felix was still committed to boosting his poison affinity talent, training new abilities, mastering old ones, and increasing the range. Because of his previous experience in the Cold Lone Island tribe, his start was hundred times better, making him improve at a noticeable speed even in merely a couple of weeks. As for his party, they went to the front lines to help out the Meyer marauders to reclaim their territories and also train whatever things they had learned before. Explosive Madness Fungi With a high-pitched shout from Olivia, the sky above the Scorch Landers was illuminated with thousands of green runic hexes, causing them to feel a sudden urge of dread, knowing exactly what was coming for them. Freeze! Before they could attempt to create defensive measures against Olivia's incoming assault, they found themselves unable to move an inch besides their pupils. Just like them, the lava sea, the explosions, the throne abilities, and everything near them was frozen in time. Selfie appeared hovering in the sky next to Olivia, looking as radiant as ever, making it impossible for anyone to imagine such a pure-looking soul casting this horrific spell. Phew! Phew phew! While everyone was frozen in time, thousands of grotesque and unsettling dark mushrooms began to rain down on the Scorch Landers. Because of the time being frozen on the battleground, they suffered from the same fate the moment they entered the area where the time was stopped. However, this didn't pose much of an issue as Olivia was capable of manually blowing them. Now. So, the instant she blew them, Selfie unpaused the time in the battlefield, allowing those explosions to engulf any Scorch Lander near them. Boom boom boom. The Scorch Landers might be immune to heat, but the explosion force still did plenty of damage to their physical bodies as some of the golems had gotten blown out. Since elementals could easily recover their physical bodies, this wasn't really their purpose for the assault. Push now! Olivia shouted cutely at the Meyer marauders. Splash! Without the Scorch Landers to defend their lava sea, the Meyer marauders pushed their swamp forward and managed to reclaim a bit of territory. Sadly, this didn't really change anything since the girls' spells range wasn't as vast as Felix, which meant they affected merely a small area in the battleground. Rumble rumble. Suddenly, everyone was forced to focus on the far distance behind the Scorch Landers after the ground began tremoring. What came before them was a massive thick storm of volcanic ash, heading in their direction. Before anyone could react, thousands upon thousands of Scorch Landers appeared within the smog causing the Meyer marauders to have their eyes widened in disbelief and horror. The reinforcement has arrived. Attack. The reinforcement has arrived. Attack. 
Zytos roared at his armies while standing on top of the lava wall. In the past few weeks, his anger was building up within him as their territory was being devoured bit by bit and they had no way of stopping it. To make matters worse, Whenever they noticed that Felix wasn't involved in the war, they switched their defense to offense again, hoping to take advantage of his absence. Alas, the moment they did this, Felix teleported to the battlefield and made them pay a heavy price with another flood capable of burning their souls. When this happened twice and they ended up losing more than five kilometers in the process, Zytos was forced to focus completely on defense until the reinforcement arrival. Now that it arrived, he could finally switch things around. Rumble rumble. F asterisk CK, there are too many of them, inform the chief. What the hell is this? How can the reinforcement be this heavy? Inform the chief. Inform the chief. The Meyer marauders were left in utter shambles as their momentum shattered when they noticed the numbers behind the reinforcement. Even the most optimistic of them knew they would get their armies blazed through barbarically. While the Meyer marauders were panicking, Olivia, Bodadai, and Selfa looked at each other in surprise. It really happened just like Felix predicted. Olivia said. Damn, he even got the timing almost right. Bodadai murmured, is he a sorcerer? Just as Selfa was about to add something, she went into battle mode after a flash of light appeared near her. When it disappeared and she saw that it was Felix, she dropped her guard down and scolded him, how many times did I tell you not to teleport this close to us? Felix ignored her as he narrowed his eyes at the incoming flood of Scorch Landers. They really went all out. Asna commentated. The numbers are more or less the same as we have calculated. Candace replied, I am more surprised by their aggressiveness as they seem to be coming at us without a plan. Speed is the key to winning this conflict. Felix shared, Lord Hesha's knows that the sooner he conquered the Meyer marauders, the quicker he can return the reinforcement to their positions. He he, if he is relying on speed, then he is going to be taught a tough lesson. Asna giggled, knowing that Felix didn't spend those past weeks doing nothing to prepare for the war. As the newly appointed leader of Meyer marauders army, it was apparent that he was going to shoulder such responsibility regardless of the cost. Time to contact those fogies and launch our attack. Felix smiled coldly. Three weeks earlier, two days after Felix's first appearance on the battleground. Felix could be seen drinking a cup of tea in the village hall with Chief Drogath and a couple of his commanders. Are you sure about this? It's going to cost you a lot. Chief Drogath asked as he eyed Felix. I don't mind. Felix smiled. We are in this together now and it won't be right not to go all in. Felix planned before on joining the conflict and doing the bare minimum to secure Chief Drogatha's assistance in his training. However, after everything that happened, his plan was forcefully altered. Now, he knew that Lord Hesha's was going to go all out on the Meyer marauders, this meant his training wouldn't last a decade if the tribe got conquered. So, it was in his best interest to go all out in protecting it at least until he was satisfied with his poison manipulation improvement. We are really grateful for your help. Willow said as she bowed her head deeply. Don't thank me yet. Felix looked at the sky and requested with a serious tone, King Valdher, is it possible to get a few minutes of your time? MMMM. The moment Felix heard the acknowledgement noise, he voiced his proposal, is it possible to hire your services as a message carrier between the bordering tribes of the Scorch Landers? I am willing to pay handsomely on weekly basis. Felix understood that if he wanted the Meyer Marauders to survive the Scorch Landers on slaughter, he would need the help of other tribes. However, communication was a massive barrier in this galaxy without Queen AI. So, he came up with the idea of turning either King Valdher or Elder Stravi as their message carrier since they were the only ones on this continent with the ability to speak with anyone. You are quite brave to suggest such a humiliating job to a king. Suddenly King Valdher's featureless face appeared near Felix, making him flinch. As I said, I am willing to pay handsomely. Felix disclosed swiftly, two containers on a weekly basis for the next decade. 
Chief Drogath and his commander's eyes couldn't help but widen at Felix's proposal. Even King Valdher showed a surprised look, not expecting the offer to be really this generous. Two containers on weekly basis for a decade translated to a thousand and he had to do nothing but deliver messages once in a while. Still, King Valdher wasn't planning on agreeing at once. Five containers a week and I will consider it. Three containers a week, this is my last offer. I am not interested in haggling with you, five or nothing. I see. Felix sighed in disappointment, I guess this leaves me no choice but to seek out Supreme Elder. Thank you Elder for your time, I don't want to hold you for much longer. Cough, why are you in such a rush? King Valdher switched his tone to a much kinder one as he said, How about we settle at four containers? I will also make sure that the messages find their target instantly. Felix scratched his head with a difficult look, seeming like he was having a problem with accepting the offer. Just as King Valdher thought that Felix would reject him, he suddenly broke a forced smile and said, I am counting on you, Elder. Good, good, good. King Valdher smiled widely as he promised, you won't be disappointed. I have my trust in you. After King Valdher left, Chief Drogath and his commanders gave Felix a look filled with gratitude and appreciation. With a simple calculation, they found out that Felix was going to pay for more than 2,000 containers in a mere decade. That was a huge favor in their eyes. Don't look at me like that. Felix said with a solemn tone, we have contacted other tribes and are seeking out an alliance as fast as possible. Based on Lord Hesha's character, he would definitely come at us much harder instead of playing it slow. You're right. Chief Drogath replied calmly, I will handle the alliance's creation. It's best that you continue your training, I will call you when I have an update. Sounds good to me. Felix nodded in agreement and excused himself. It took Chief Drogath a couple of hours of back-and-forth messaging with the other chiefs to convince them about the alliance. The fact that the Scorchlanders had pulled a considerable amount of their armies against those tribes made it easier to convince them. When everyone was on board, Chief Drogath reached out to Felix again on his next move. Now, the tricky part. Felix uttered as he stood in an empty area with Chief Drogath. What do you mean? Felix narrowed his eyes at the sky as he answered, communication with other tribes is only useful to their side as we are the ones who will get the bigger hit. Chief Drogath nodded in understanding. He already knew that the Alliance wouldn't really come to their rescue when SH-T hit the fan since the distance between each other was just too much. This meant the only use of the Alliance was to organize a grouped attack on the Scorchlanders if they dared go all out on the Mire Marauders. This would indeed make the Scorchlanders pay a heavy price, but at the same time, the Mire Marauders would get absolutely demolished. L1 T Lagoon witnessed the first publication of this chapter on N0 Velbion. If so, it was nothing more than mutual destruction, Felix wasn't too hot on losing this poison sacred ground so soon. If I want my plan to work, we need Supreme Elder's permission badly. Felix said. Permission for what? Felix turned to look at him and uttered with a serious tone, permission to establish spatial portals between us and the other tribes.